Uh, hey, did you get some rest after that weekend? Nope. Nope, not not really. Um, yeah, I woke up the next day and, like, kind of took a little bit of time. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm feeling, you know, like, a little bit of relief afterwards. And then I started getting a bunch of messages for our shoot this weekend. Um, and then I'm acting in and producing another short film the weekend immediately after that. And so, like, there was no, like, all the anxiety that had washed away just immediately came back in as, as I was like, oh, God, I, uh, I, I'm a big, like, to-do list person, because if it's not on that list, I will probably forget it. Um, and so I went through and, uh, like, checked off almost everything other than, like, the post side of things for the event, and then switched over um, and started typing up my to-do list for this weekend and just oh it was <laughs> it was it was more than i was expecting but uh thankfully i've got um justice and emily who uh have who do a lot um to to help relieve relieve what's on my plate <laughs> so did when's justice moving to georgia um the end of the month and i thought it was already so that's going to be my next question is like, if, did he leave? Like, how are you going to pull off this big shoot that you have coming up? Right. No, that's why we had to do it now. Cause we delayed it because of COVID. And then, um, and then I was working on the event. And so, uh, justice was like, all right, we have like the last two weeks of August. <laughs> Otherwise you're going to have to get a different cinematographer. And I was like, well, I'm not doing that. So we're going to make it work. <laughs> And we've had like actors drop out and all kinds of stuff. I've rewritten the opening scene four times now because of uh, production issues or the actor dropping out or one thing or another. Um, and I think what we've got is going to be really, really cool. And I think Justice is really excited from a cinematography standpoint because one takes are always really hard, but really satisfying when you pull them off. So It'll be interesting to see how that all comes together, but I'm I'm excited for it. I think it'll be really good. I always get one or boners. I know, right? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. This Did is you have just a like a really simple like dollying shot through through the scene. But uh it's still yeah, we we've got it on a we rented a jib, um, so that we could have a little bit of dynamic movement even if it's on a dolly. So That's exciting. I'm excited to see that. Yeah, I'll have to send you, uh, I've got a rough cut. Well, it's not a rough cut. Like the other than the opening scene, the rest of the film is pretty much done. I have to edit one one scene that just is, isn't quite working. And then we need to trim a couple of shots, just like the little finesses and stuff like that. But it's pretty much done. So I'll have to, I'll have to send you over the, the cut and you can let me know what you think. Yeah, dude, for sure. Do you, do you have a favorite winner? Like, is there a winner that's inspiring the shot that you're planning? Uh, there's no one that's inspiring this particular shot. And I'm kind of just drawing a blank on like inspiring winners. I mean, like you said, pretty much any are really fantastic. Um, I don't know if this really counts because it's pretty much entirely digital and CG, but like the opening of Deadpool just like moving through the car and stuff and then all the credits coming up with it. Like I, I love that one. And then, um, I mean, just the default generic answer of like anything that Deacons does is, I don't know, he doesn't do a ton of winners, but just, yeah. And anything Deacons does is, oh yeah, I, I'm in love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, it's like, he doesn't do many winners unless it's like 1917 right i was about to say I was like, as soon as i said that i was about to say well there is 1917 i'm like nah people know <laughs> uh i think w w one of my favorite winners is from true detective i think it's like episode six in the first season i still have not watched true detective i gotta be honest like i i'm so bad at keeping up on movies and like Beginning of 2019, Jacob and I, back when we were like trying to do YouTube um, and then very quickly gave up, 
made a like most anticipated of 2019. Uh, I don't think I saw most of the movies on that list until 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, so, you're busy though, uh, so cut yourself some slack. I know. I do watch plenty. I, like I actually watch more TV than movies, um, but the TV I watch is like nothing I would ever make. You know, I, I watch a lot of a lot of kids animated shows, especially because I, I help take care of my nieces. Um, and also because there are just some good ones, like especially on Netflix, uh, like Guillermo del Toro uh, produced and uh, is the like the, I'm not sure if he is the showrunner, but he's developed uh, Troll Hunters. I don't know if you've seen that at all, but it's actually a really oh. good show and it's gotten like a couple of spinoffs that aren't as good, but they're still pretty fun. Um, and then I, I watch a lot of like documentaries and stuff like that. I uh, in fact, thanks to Patrick, uh, just finished up Love on the Spectrum, um, which he's right. Like that, that is a really good show. <laughs> I have family who are on the spectrum, and uh, especially like there, there were a lot of things I related to in that. <laughs> Dude, Patrick's like the guru of like reality TV, like docu series some sorts. <laughs> yeah, see, I've never been into reality TV. I was never into Survivor. Like, I watched a little bit of Naked and Afraid, just like clips and stuff, but I was never into reality TV. Um, but yeah, Love on the Spectrum is really, really good. And then I've been watching, uh, like, Unsolved Mysteries and World's Most Wanted and stuff like that. And then just a bunch of other docs, um, like uh, on Hulu, it's Hamilton's Pharmacopia. It's just he's a he's a chemist that just like goes around the world and uh, researches and experiments with psychedelics and just different drugs and stuff. Um, and it's really interesting. And there's some really cool stuff in there. I'll have to check that out. I, I think I've, I've been trying to get more into like the alien conspiracy videos because oh, they yeah. seem so innocent compared to like what's going on now. <laughs> Well, I think it's, isn't it, Disney Plus has one now. I haven't watched it yet, but it's called like, uh, e like European UFOs or something like that, or like uh, UFO Europe. I think it's called UFO Europe. And because uh, you always hear about them in America, but you don't hear as much about European ones. But apparently there's enough of them to make a, a whole series on it. I got to check that out then. Yeah, I like, I like those sci-fi documentaries where it's like pushing conspiracies that are like more innocent than what's going on now so <laughs> oh yeah ancient aliens is like it's it's the it's one of the best garbage shows like <laughs> it's so it's so dumb but it is so much fun to watch because every once in a while you get that thing where you're like maybe like that might you know uh, and i'm a big science geek i definitely like i've always kind of believed in aliens but not like they visited us kind of thing. And like, if, if they're out there, they, we would be like ants or something, you know, just like a passing glance kind of thing. Um, but after seeing some of those shows, like makes you, makes you question. And some of those experiences are pretty interesting. I think on, on unsolved mysteries, they had one episode that was on like an event back in the sixties where across like a 300 mile radius, a bunch of people who didn't know each other all had the exact same like abduction experience. Um, and that was actually pretty interesting and had that, it was one of those moments where I was like, maybe like that, that or there is something <laughs> in the water. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, wasn't that one like, so I haven't seen that show. I don't like, I, if I've seen that show, it's probably been like when it first aired, you know, like back in elementary yeah, way back when yeah. day TV, whatever. But um, if I remember correctly, people have been talking about that episode saying it's pretty terrifying. The the alien one? Yeah. Yeah, it's it it's mainly because it's a bunch of people who again they had allegedly they had like no connection to each other. They didn't know each other. They just lived in this like small county or across a couple of small counties and they were all the exact same experiences. Most of them like didn't remember anything, but a couple of people claimed that they did. Um, and there was one or two that like had alleged witnesses that actually saw the people like get hit with the beam of light or all that stuff. So it was, yeah, it's definitely, it makes you question. That's for sure. You're like, Ooh, what if? <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. I love those conspiracies, but all right, sir, let's have you introduce yourself. Yeah, um, well, my name is Michael Merrill, um, and I 
primarily identify as a producer. Um, I do direct and I write a lot. Um, I edit, I do a little bit of everything, um, but I, I do kind of tell people like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a producer. Um, just because saying I'm a jack of all trades does not get you work as it took me two years in the industry to find out. Um, but it does make you a pretty decent producer sometimes. So uh, no regrets. But yeah, there was a good two years where I, when people would ask me what I did, I would say, oh, I'm, a, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. I do a little of this, a little of that. And uh, problem with that is people, um, you know, it's in the industry, you want to be the person people think about. Like if, if I need a sound guy, um, Maya Kraus is like my, my go-to sound mixer and, um, uh, and justice is my DP. And, you know, you have those people that you just think of immediately. Um, but as useful as a jack of all trades is like, it's not what makes people think of you. Um, and so it definitely held me back for a little while before I finally kind of found producing, um, which was something I'd been doing all along just without really realizing it. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I say producer now, thankfully, <laughs> and it's starting to pay off. How, how would you define a producer? Because there's so many different, <laughs> there are a lot so of different, different ways to go about it. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's largely because there are a lot of different kinds of producers and it's something that's really not understood, especially on an indie level. Um, you know, once you get onto bigger sets, it's, it's, you have your line producer, you have your UPM, you know, you have all these different producers that all do very different things. Um, but when you get into the indie sphere, you usually will have like one, maybe two producers and then like the director who's also producing. Um, but really for me, I, I would say that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about defining a producer, but I'd say a producer's job is to ensure that a production gets from start to finish um, with as much um, quality uh, while adhering as much to the director's vision as possible. Um, because you do have to balance a lot of things, you know, you, uh, you, you need to pay for everything, you need to, you know, get an audience for it and get people to watch it. Um, but to, I think good producers are able to do that while still protecting the director's vision. Um, and when it, especially when it comes to being on set, I think that the best producers um, are really there to kind of shield and protect the director from a lot of the other stressors and issues that are going on so that they can do their job. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'd say that that's how I define a producer. <laughs> And is, when did you start getting into filmmaking? Um, so I started in theater when I was really, really young. I was acting. I, uh, I helped, like, helped write uh, an opera when I was, like, nine or ten years old. Uh, it was, like, a school project, and the, the person who was doing this workshop um, I, I was a very quiet kid and, and sat in the back of the class, but noticed that I peaked up and, and got really interested um, when they were kind of developing the story because it was like a big thing where the kids got to help come up with the story and, and help with the music and they did stage crew and like I, the whole thing. Everybody got a job. Um, and I, uh, the, the class came up with a story about the... Um, about like a, you know, a knight going after a dragon who's terrifying the land, you know, typical kid stuff. Um, and, and I, I raised my hand and I asked, why does the dragon have to be the bad guy? Um, cause I was really into dragons at that time. Uh, and apparently that, that was enough for the teacher to kind of, um, take some interest and encourage me to kind of help, you know, so I got to move out to the front of the class and, and help with that. Um, and that just set me off on this path of like, just writing. I eventually directed a few short one act plays in junior high and or, or in high school. Um, I acted a bunch, uh, but it was never, it was always something that other people were pushing me into. Like I had no confidence in myself. I did not think like, oh, I want to do this. It's this big passion. I was surrounded by people who'd been doing theater since they were even younger than me and who like weren't even into movies. They were just theater kids. Um, and so 
it was always just something that, uh, like I had a teacher who would just cast me. I didn't audition. She would just be like, you're going to be in this. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, I, I ended up writing and directing a few things. And then I went to Denmark for a little while after I graduated high school. And when I came back, I was very, um, I had no direction. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had no idea how to apply myself and I was just working retail and stuff. Um, and my, my mom was actually the one who kind of said, well, you've always loved movies and you've done theater all this time. Like, why don't you try getting into that? Um, and so I got on some student films and, uh, acted in that. And then eventually, uh, sort of produced without knowing what it was, just kind of helping with story development and then running production and stuff like that. Um, and then that just slowly led me up to bigger and bigger sets. Um, I was able to get on a, a few larger projects, but not too many. And a lot of them that never saw the light of day or, you know, how, how it goes. Um, and then, yeah, I, I don't remember how old I was when I directed my first film, but it was like maybe six years ago. So I guess I was like 23, 24. Um, and I got really, I was usually pretty frustrated with the sets that I got on for one reason or another. And so eventually it was just like, well, you know, if I, if I think I know better then I need to try it, try it myself and not just be that person who like shit talks on, <laughs> on other people. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wrote a short script and, and we shot it in like a weekend with just a bunch of people I'd met on another set. Um, and then after that, it was just, no, I, 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 this is just what I want to do, like with the rest of my life. So yeah, I, that's, that's how I got, sorry, long winded there, but yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. No, no, not, not long winded at all. Not long enough. I'll just say that. Uh, I mean, I can go into more detail. <laughs> I'm always very nervous about rambling too long because I do have a lot of, a lot of stories, but yeah. It, uh, I, I was going to ask you the the first short that you did um, with the people you met on that set, what, mm -hmm. what genre was that? Like what kind of short film was it? Um, it was like a com, it was kind of a comedy. Um, it never, we never put it out anywhere, um, but it was this comedy. Uh, actually, no, it, it did get put out. I think there's a link to it on our YouTube. So I've, I don't go back and rewatch my films very often, but uh, yeah, it was called Ink, um, and it was somebody else had written it um, and got a bunch of people together, and I think most of them were like first year film students, uh, maybe second, um, and so we kind of just like, all right, who wants to do this? And then someone would raise their hand, you know, and it came. I, I was quiet and. Um, let other people speak mostly out of just like, oh, I don't know how to do anything. So um, eventually the only two things left were cinematographer and director. And I was like, well, I definitely do not know how to do cinematography at that point. And so I, I guess I'll be the director um, because I'd done that before for theater. And so I figured like, well, there's, at least there's some crossover there. Uh, and um, yeah, it was a, it was, it was a, really funny comedy. I got to do, I did a rewrite on the script and then, um, we went through and it was a lot of fun. I, uh, I didn't have anything to do with post-production, unfortunately. I wish I had, um, uh, but I had other stuff going on. And so the, the writer slash producer slash actor ended up editing, editing the film, but yeah, it was really fun. And it, it was a huge learning experience for sure. Um, and yeah, that, that, uh, I that's where I met Lucas Barrows and Adam Townsend, who um, were the producers and cinematographer for my first, like, real, just my written and directed short film, uh, Nomads, um, which we put out, like, two years ago or something like that. It's been, yeah, it's been some time. Yeah, I, it has. You sh you sh I remember you showed me a cut of that. Um <laughs> when I came over onto your podcast about like a year ago, roughly. Yeah. Oh yeah. It has only been a year. We shot it a while ago, but yeah. yeah, it was, it was a very long post process largely because we thought we had a final cut. Um, and then we took it to the, I think it was like the, it was one of the higher level editing 
courses um and the the instructor there let us come in and show the film to the entire like senior editing class <laughs> um and I I opened myself up right at the start and I was like, hey, like I am a new director. I want to learn. I yeah. like, please do not hold back on your feedback. I'm not going to be offended. Like rip it apart. Please tell me what's wrong with it. Because I knew it was just not quite like I felt pretty confident, but I was like, eh, it still needs a little work. Um, and then for the next hour and a half, they like there were supposed to be other films shown at the class. And I don't think they ended up showing any of them because they just spent the whole time uh you know in a constructive way ripping apart <laughs> nomads uh and we very quickly realized like we needed to cut a good like 10 15 minutes off the film uh the 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 biggest chunk of it was what the professor called drone porn um <laughs> it was just anytime young filmmakers get a drone like they just oh they love it and they want all the drone shots and yeah there was a like probably a solid four minutes of footage that was just drone shots that we got <laughs> out of it. <laughs> so yeah, that's, I, I very quickly learned. I was like, meh, hold back on the drones. Uh, I don't think I've even used a drone actually since then, but yeah. It's, drone it, porn. <laughs> yeah, it was really funny too, because it, one of the other students brought it up about like, oh, well, I think you could probably cut some of like the establishing shots because there's a lot of like drone footage there. And just from the back of the class, the professor under his breath goes, drone porn. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, we were like, yeah, that definitely needs to go. Um, and yeah, like it's, uh, it's, I, I always have to be careful because I'm really, I'm very self-critical and I, I tend to focus a lot on like what I would have done different, what I would have changed. Yeah. Um, but like that film was a huge, for all for all the things I wish had been done differently, it was a huge accomplishment because um, it was done with literally no money um, and very last minute. I had had another project that I had been working on for over six months. It was a much, much larger project um, we had a we had a line producer from LA analyze it and estimated the production uh, if we had had to pay for everything because most of it was donated people were volunteering their time stuff like that um, but if we had actually had to pay for everything it would have been close to like a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred and fifty thousand dollar short film um, if we had actually had to pay the cast and crew rent all the gear purchase the lo you know rent the locations all that stuff like it was huge um and then at like last minute we were about to launch a crowdfunding campaign um and the producers pulled out uh and unfortunately um most everybody we probably could have done without but there was one producer that like we really needed in order to make it work um and so yeah that whole thing just kind of fell apart uh, and I've had it on the back burner of like something I eventually want to do. And it does not need that much money. Like we were way over what, what we needed for that. Uh, thanks to everybody who had, who had contributed. Um, and we, it could probably be done for maybe 10 to 15,000, you know, now, especially knowing what I know now and all the experience I've gained and stuff like could definitely do it a lot, a lot cheaper than that. But yeah, it's, it's always been on the back burner. Um, but I was really devastated by it. It broke my heart. Like that was a major passion project. Um, and you know, there, there's no guarantees, but it was that mindset of just like, this is going to be my big break and like, it's going to kickstart my career. And, um, so I felt a lot of self doubt and was very, um, very nervous that, um, some things that had been said were, tr you know, might, might be true about like my abilities. you know, there were, um, uh, just a lot of just self doubt and, and, and concern. And so I went to Lucas and Adam and was just like, I need to shoot something. I have no idea what to shoot. I've got no plan, no anything. Um, and they were like, awesome. We're on board. Like just get a script and, and we'll do it. And so I think I wrote nomads in like, maybe a day and then took a week to do some touch-ups and rewrites. Um, and then we went into production and like a week before production, we had uh, all three of our actors just dropped out for, for different reasons. One of them got sick. Another one had a family member die. Uh, and another one just had some scheduling conflict come up with a, with a paid gig. Um, 
So we had to Damn recast. Those paid gigs. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but yeah, we had to recast the week before the shoot. I ended up stepping in to one of the roles and acted in it just because we couldn't find anybody else. Um, and then we were able to fill the other two roles. And um, yeah, for for working with actors who had not acted since like high school, if at all, uh, for a production that had very little planning and preparation and all that stuff, like. Um, it it had no right to come together as, as well as it, it did, but it did come together. So <laughs> I was really happy with it. But yeah. Yeah. I I um I really like the music of it. Oh yeah, Josh Sohn was yeah. amazing. And I think when you showed me one of the rough cuts, I there was this like certain sequence that was like really exciting. And you're like, you like that? I'm glad you like didn't notice his error. And I'm like, what, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? <laughs> oh, you, yeah. yeah. The uh, there's a there's a Ronin stand, like very <laughs> clearly in one of the shots. And <laughs> no, no the, there's only ever been one person that noticed it without me like prompting them. You know, uh, yeah. yeah. Which that was another big lesson on that that I've applied to every shoot since. Which is like, it's it's twofold. Which is a like trust like don't don't worry like there's a lot of stuff the audience is going to notice and a lot of that comes to like i where where the attention is focused and i'm sure you've seen those videos where they like track people's eye movements on the screen um and like there's a little have, have you seen any of those no. it's a really cool experiment they do it in a theater and they or um or i think I think they may do it with individuals and like a just screen it a bunch of times, but they track where people's eyes are focused on the screen and they've used it to show um, like how um, people's perception is so like unreliable um, and things that are, uh, but also as a cinematography tool um, to show like how to like with editing and stuff, particularly action. Uh, making sure that the audience doesn't get disoriented by uh, keeping the place where your audience's eye line is focused in the same spot between cuts. Um, anyway, but uh, so ever since then, um, I've taken that and really like made that a point to focus on like, okay, where is my audience actually looking? Um, and then the other side of that, uh, just because sometimes it comes across as like, the audience is pretty stupid and you can get away with a lot, <laughs> um, which is the opposite, which is, I, I think, um, more of a story, you know, more it, it applies more to story, um, but the audience is smarter than, you th than most filmmakers give them credit for. Um, and there is a lot, particularly with, with nomads, that is implied. Um, and especially in the early cut, we cut a lot of stuff out story-wise for Nomads. Um, but that was one of the notes that the editing instructor uh, kind of made was we had a lot of feedback from students that was all about like, oh, well, you mentioned uh, a red zone and like, but you never explain it. And so that, that might confuse your audience. And the professor was like, how many post-apocalyptic films have you seen? Like, we all know what the red zone is. Like, he doesn't have to explain it. It's someplace you probably shouldn't go, you know? Um, and so there was a lot of moments like that where it's like, no, like, filmmaking has been around for a long time. People watch a lot of movies and, and particularly with those genres and those tropes, like, you can get away with a lot to help make your story more concise. Oh, yeah. Um, that you know that just that whole exposition dump you know and there's always show don't tell but there's also a lot that you can still tell and but not have to turn it into exposition just because you're relying on knowing your audience knowing that like hey if this is a sci-fi film or a horror film the people watching it are probably going to be sci-fi and horror fans and so they're going to be they're going to know these tropes and i can use that to my advantage um, to tighten up the story or to, you know, help me in the edit if I need to get around something and stuff like that. So, yeah, it is, uh, it's kind of a, I don't know, double-edged sword, I guess, of like the audience is smarter than you think, but they'll also not notice a lot of stuff and you can get away with a lot. So uh, it's just kind of finding that that balance of like not being condescending to your audience, but also 
trusting that they will be forgiving or or might not notice those mistakes that we as filmmakers are very aware of especially when you've gone through an edit 200 times uh -huh. um, and you see it over and over and over again it's going to bother the hell out of you you know um, but someone like that Ronan stand, someone who watches it the first time is not going to notice. So, yeah. There's there's a shot in uh, Night of Adventure where it's it's where Casey and Emily are walking toward the camera before they go on their adventure, you know, before mm -hmm. they uh, hijack that cop car. But um, I've edited that movie so many times, you know, like I've seen it so many times. And it wasn't until recently that I noticed you could see the boom shadow <laughs> on oh, the yeah. side of the camera. And I'm like... Wait, what, what? Like, why has nobody mentioned this to me ever? And I'm just barely noticing it. <laughs> because no one else probably noticed, you know, that's, yeah. It's like one of those delayed reactions. I'm like, did I go in and fix it? I'm like, no, that's, yeah. that's right. We well, also there. have the advantage of the the lighting and that because it's at night um, yeah. and you're using a lot of street lights and things like that, like people subconsciously will just be like, oh, it's a street lamp or it's a, it's a flag something else. or yeah. it's something else. You know, they're not going to think about that. Yeah, but I, I just clear as day. There it is, like by their feet, and I'm just like, <laughs> and it'll it'll haunt you for the rest of your days. You'll, uh, you'll never be able to think about Night of Adventure without thinking about that that shot. You know, <laughs> like, there's, there's that's a who lot. we are as filmmakers. Um, <laughs> and so so let's let's transition to um because you did a quick turnaround by the way. So like when you and I first started talking, you were still working on Nomads. Oh yeah, and, and it seemed like you definitely got that out of the way within like months of us talking. Mm -hmm. And then you had this grand idea for uh, through the Valley of the Hunter. So it was yeah. called, right? <laughs> yeah. And like, here you are, like already entered into a couple festivals and yeah, got some recognition there. And I think that's really cool, dude. <laughs> another, yeah, another, another yeah. You're quick at turnarounds. Yeah. I mean, I try, I'm not, um, I, I would like to be faster. Um, a lot of a lot of that comes down to perspective, and this is something I really struggle with. And I've I've found the more I've produced on other people's projects um, or done, I mean, just in general, just working with anybody. Um, oh, sorry, my dog just started barking and totally distracted me. Um, where was I? Go where was I going? Yeah. Um, we, we compare ourselves a lot um, to the people that we watch and the people that we follow. I mean, it's a big discussion with social media. I saw you post earlier today, you know, about like, do you use social media? Do you think it's necessary and stuff like that? And yeah. um, I didn't comment, but I'll give my opinion now, I guess, which is that social media is an amazing tool and it has allowed indie filmmakers to do far more than we ever would have been able to without it. That being said, I have no doubt um, that it has also caused us to lose a lot of potentially amazing filmmakers because of um, imposter syndrome, you know, and uh, that's something that I have always really, really struggled with is feeling like I was not talented, like I was not good enough, I had no right to be where I was, um, and uh, what I... the point I was started with was that with with that um, wanting to to have faster turnarounds most of what I watch is youtubers and um, I I didn't get to go to film school I had a scholarship and then I decided to chase a girl off to Denmark instead um, and uh, which was a great great idea uh, loved the trip but uh, probably should have taken up that scholarship <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I joke that I went to YouTube Academy. You know, um, everything I learned is from podcasts and interviews and books and, and just, you know, figuring out myself. Um, and that's awesome. But when you are comparing yourself to people who are doing YouTube, um, they have much faster turnarounds. Their shorts are one or two minutes long. If they're making short films, you know, they're... Um, they've had a lot more practice with lighting because they're constantly doing their own setups. You know, there's all these different things that you can compare yourself to that it's very easy to forget that you are on completely different paths. Even if they're talking about filmmaking, you are on a completely different path than they are, you know, and that's been 
a really big thing that that Jacob um, and I have have had to work through is knowing what our long term goals are, knowing what what do we want to be as producers, as a company, you know, as a brand. Um, how, what what is our path? And um, it's very easy to get things muddled up, you know, and uh, that that was a big big learning curve there was was finally f- figuring out what that was and what we wanted to be and then and then working backwards from that long-term goal of like okay what do we need to be doing now and who should we be comparing ourselves to in terms of like are we putting out enough content how fast are our turnarounds are we putting the right resources in the right places and and that sort of thing um so while we do have relatively fast turnarounds on our shorts for what they are um i'm always in that back of my mind like i'm not doing enough you know uh, my first year um once we started the company uh, i directed six short films and produced three or four um and then the following year did uh, well i guess the following year was three short films um, and this year we've shot one and we haven't even released it yet. Um, and then obviously we've got COVID to deal with, but even that aside, you know, um, it's, it's definitely been something kind of eating at the back of my mind that like, well, I need to be doing more, you know, I'm, I'm not doing enough. I've only put out one thing and, um, you know, everyone responds with, well, you've also, you know, you produced a film festival and it's a much larger, like the film that you're working on is much larger. It's like three times the budget of anything we've done before, um, much, uh, slightly larger crew. Um, and we have bigger plans for what we want to do with it once it's done. Um, but it's hard to remind yourself of that, you know, and I think that's going back to what does a producer do? I think that's one of the important things that you need as a director in a good producer is someone who's going to understand what your goals are with each project and kind of help remind you or put things into context of like, you're doing okay. You know, you're, 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 you're on the right track or you're doing the right thing, you know, just to kind of, uh, kind of fight off that imposter syndrome a little bit, you know, and I've been very lucky to have Jacob and Emily, um, who are my producing partners and, and they're very good at, at helping calm that, uh, anxiety inside of me and just say like, no, we're doing okay. We're doing awesome. You know, like take a moment to, to appreciate everything that you've accomplished because as creatives, most of us are just constantly, thinking about the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And we don't stop to kind of look back and acknowledge um, all the work that we've put in to get to the point we're at, you know? Yeah. Um, no, that's fair. Sorry, I, I totally forgot what the original question was. And I just went on this he, another long, like tangent. I, I do that. a lot. No, <laughs> no yeah. we're just talking about turnaround rates, but um, going back to that whole social media thing, uh, <laughs> because like I've the only reason I asked that question on Facebook is like, you know, as an artist, do you use it to promote it or do you use it to socialize? Like, like how do you actually use it? And it, it seems like, cause like, especially during COVID and during like an election year, like it's just so much negative articles. There's so much yeah. misconceptions and so much misinformation and like, nobody's going to listen. There's like, you could be as civil as you want online and like you could feel like you you've made this course right like a positive impact by trying to discuss different viewpoints but like point of the matter is nobody's going to give a fuck at the end of the day yeah but the second they close their facebook down they're not gonna be like i had a really interesting conversation no <laughs> they're gonna be like wow fuck that guy i'm you know either on follower block or you know like just avoid commenting in general and so and like i've fallen into the trap of being kind of political on it and mm-hmm. i've worked I, I tried so hard for like the past year to refrain from it. And then of course shit hits the fan early on in the year and like I get sucked right into it and I'm like, I don't care who knows my viewpoints, whatever. Then now I'm just like, maybe I shouldn't, you know, like take it back, take a step back. Cause like it's in the end, nobody's going to care. Like if anybody who actually cares would actually like want to have this conversation like in person or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, so it's, it's and like, it's, I don't know. It's what, what were you going to say? <laughs> 
I was just going to say, it's a, I mean, it's, it's really difficult because, you know, we, we want to, especially when it comes to social issues like that, like, you know, we, you know, regardless of what side of the aisle you fall on, you think your opinions are right. Yeah. And especially in these social issues, it, it makes those opinions far louder and more passionate, you know, in the way you think about them. Um, and it's, it's really difficult to not um, go to one extreme or the other of having your social media become an echo chamber where everybody just agrees with you um, or in the reverse where, you know, it's, you're just constantly arguing and battling. And I know after the, or leading up to and a little bit after the 2016 election, like I was in the same boat. I would, most of my posts were political. I would get into huge debates and comments and stuff like that. Um, and I very, you know, like you said, very quickly realized nobody cares. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, I have found that you can make some difference with, you know, the occasional good discourse and, and um, being non-combative with the way that you present your information and, and stuff like that. But even doing that, it's incredibly difficult. You know, we, we try, I try very hard to just present facts and just to, you know, and, and to not, um, to always kind of come from a place of, assuming that the other person is not um, an idiot or evil or ignorant or anything like that, but maybe is just misinformed or they have a different background and things like that. But even doing that a lot of the time, it still comes down to like, oh no, this person is just an idiot or they just literally will never change their opinion no matter what information you present to them, you know? And so for me, I've, I really had to kind of, shift focus and i think i don't know if this is 100 percent true but in in my head it is which is that um i'm pretty sure that the majority of the friends i have on facebook and instagram or at least on facebook um don't actually follow me anymore because of all that <laughs> stuff from years ago and they like unfollowed me because they got annoyed and then never yeah. re-followed me because i'm like there are a lot of people who like I know I'm friends with and they would totally be like liking my posts or sharing the films or whatever else, but I never see them comment or like, or do anything. And then I think about it. I'm like, yeah, I probably just annoyed the shit out of them. And so now they don't, they don't follow and they just don't think about it anymore. You know, so it can damage you even if you're on the right side of history. And so I've found that for me, like I've just moved, I, I'm still very passionate about those issues. I've just moved it off of social media, you know, where it's like, if I'm in person with somebody and they present some misinformation or something inaccurate, like I very quickly will try and correct it. And I do still get into some debates and arguments in real life, but at the very least, if it's in real life, you have another person in front of you um, that you can empathize with. And that at the, you know, at the end of the conversation, even if it was a screaming argument, you know, after a few minutes, like, you kind of let that slide or you you're kind of like ah eh, whatever fuck it like you know it's it's a lot easier to not carry that with you because you're you're literally not carrying it with you in the form of your phone constantly where it's going off with notifications you know and and stuff like that so i think it is important for us to use social media as a tool um but i think it needs to be used very carefully and you need to have a purpose when you go in to use it and um, there have been many, you know, rants that I've cut, like I've fully typed up and then like deleted immediately after, you know, oh, or yeah. just like self pitying bullshit that I was going to post that I eventually was like, ah, no one's going to, no one's going to care about this. And nobody wants to see this in their feed. You know, it's about thinking and, and kind of trying to apply this to film. It's about thinking about what you want to put out there, you know, like, yeah, I can be angry and it is important for some people to have that passion and to be angry and to fight for the things that they believe in, because that's how we get change. Um, but particularly as artists who are more sensitive to those things, you know, it's very important for your own health, the mental health, um, to think about what you're putting out there and the effect it has. And I think that's the same way with our films, you know, um, 
the, my, my I I don't think most of my films are amazing. I'm, I love them and I'm very happy with. But I you know I I compare myself to people who are way above me um, because I'm comparing them to where I want to be eventually. Um, but that being said, I the one thing I can say that I'm super proud of with all of the films that I've done um, is that there was some kind of purpose behind them. It wasn't just like, oh, I just want to make a horror film or I just want to make this, that or the other. Um, and that's come a lot into producing on other people's projects as well, where one of the very first questions I ask when um, I'm brought in to do some script rewrites or to do consulting or anything like that, or somebody asked me to be a producer, um, the first thing I ask is, is what are your goals with this project? What is the message you're trying to send? It doesn't mean you need to have some like political statement or social statement with your film, but just like, what are you trying to put out there? You know, what, what feeling do you want people to have when they walk away from, from this experience? Um, it, go ahead. And, well, and that's like almost the complete opposite of like what I was taught in school. Um, they, they, <laughs> they were saying you want you like, if you didn't touch on social issues, if you did not include certain gender roles or people of color, or, you know, like if you weren't being politically correct in any way at all with your film, you're going to get called out on it in class. And like, it was really degrading in that sense because like not everybody thinks in that way, you know, like, I mean, yeah. for me, I just want to make cool shit, you know, like, like blade said in like one of the previous podcasts, he's just like, everybody just wants to make cool shit. And I'm like, yeah, like, why can we all just make cool shit? <laughs> and just like, oh, yeah. look, like, why, why do we have to include all these social issues? I mean, if your film touches but, on it, by all means, that's a whole different yeah. thing. But if your film, if the purpose of the film is not that at all, then like, how can you be critical of that, you know? Yeah, I think you just have to be honest with yourself, you know, about what, like I said, what the purpose of that is. And some yeah. of us do just want to make cool shit. Like, that is why we have the Fast and the Furious franchise. There is <laughs> no meat in that. Like, that is no. just let's just see some cool shit, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. I no. like popcorn flicks. Um, but that being said, I think that um, it's okay for it to just be for the sake of making something cool or wanting to tell a cool story, but you still have to ask yourself those questions. And that's how we keep ourselves from, you know, unintentionally causing harm with our work, um, which right, right. does happen, you know, um, uh, and, and in subconscious ways, you know, we talk about diversity in film, which has always been a major issue and is still continues to be an issue, um, that, that many groups are underrepresented. Um, you know, there was the, the biggest example being like ghost in the shell and that whole, you know, like why <laughs> would that have been so difficult just to find, you know, uh, an actual That's Asian Hollywood for you, play that, you know? <laughs> um, and I get that you need a star in your film, but you know, it's, it's, it's not done maliciously, but that's how we end up in these right. situations, you know, is not stopping to ask ourselves those questions and you don't have to have the right answer, you know, quote unquote, you, you just need to have asked that question. And if the answer is, I just want to make cool shit, then awesome. Um, but then follow that up with like, okay, but let's take a second just to make sure that we're still doing what we can in these other areas. You don't have to have a moral to your story or a message or some political or social, social message with your film. Um, I think films would probably be pretty boring if they were all just social or political commentaries, you know, but um you still have to ask the same questions, even if it's a cool film of like, how are we representing ourselves? You know, and what is, what, how do we want to be seen by our audience? Because again, it's all about audience building. It's about who is going to see your film. Um, and if your target audience is going to just vehemently disagree with a, with a choice you made off the cuff without thinking about it, you know, it could ruin your chances at success. Um, and so it's something you have to constantly be asking yourself of, of just how does this affect other, the audience, you know, and, and what message am I putting out there? Yeah, for, for sure. Cause like whenever I work on stuff, like whenever I'm writing or I'm directing for that matter, I always ask like, how does this ring true to me? You know, like what does it mean to yeah. me? Cause like a lot of my stuff is more personal, even like horror films, there's always like mm -hmm. the person and like, I mean like, let's say I finished a feature 
horror film that's like a full-on slasher, right? And he uses all the tropes ever, and like it's going to get criticized because of the lack of w- whatever. But like deep down, though, like the core of that is just like it's a film for those who love slasher flicks. And like, if I get excited about some of the stuff that happens in it, then like other people will too, you know, hopefully oh, yeah. fingers crossed. But, um, no, I, I agree though. Like you always have to ask yourself a question of like, w- why am I doing this? And like, what does it mean? But like there, there are people who try to cancel people who don't put more of a thing on there. And I mean, oh, that yeah. kind of ties back into the whole social media thing. Cause like if, as artists, if we're, if we can only, promote our stuff and not be human and be open to being flawed. Right. Then like, I mean, being in the media, uh, you're going to be held on a pedestal of some sort. People are going to have the spotlight on you. And then there are people who are going to go back into your past. Like we've seen with comedians and they try to cancel these comedians. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, well, why would you try to cancel the comedian? Like when they're just making a poor joke on Twitter, that you Kevin know? Hart thing was the biggest one for me that I was just like kind of heartbroken by. Cause like, I get it. Like I get why people were offended, but I've, I years before I had listened to that very com you know, that comedy bit that yeah. um, his tweet was based off of. Um, and yeah, you do have a big issue of things being taken out of context or people jumping to react and and my view of it is like yeah we need to care about all these issues and something should be said about them you know you should stand up and say hey that wasn't okay or i don't agree with that or or whatever um but it's about nuance and i think that's the biggest thing that has whether it's political or filmmaking or social issue it, it goes to everything in our culture right now not just in America, I have a lot of friends ac- across the world and, and they see similar things in their social media feeds, you know, of just this lack of, of nuance in discussions and in films and in, you know, in everything that we do. Um, and that ability to kind of take a step back and not make everything, you know, it's the, uh, what is it, the argument of equivalent or false equivalence, you know, of saying like, this thing is bad and this thing is bad, They're, therefore they are both equally bad. You know, and that was a big discussion around the last election with Hillary versus Trump. I was no fan of Hillary for sure, you know, but when you're comparing the two, you have to weigh that of, you know, it it sucks and I get it. Like, I don't want to vote for somebody who I don't believe in either. But, you know, when you are weighing the, the effect that a decision will make for years to come, again, whether it's political or social or with your films, um, you have to be able to weigh those those consequences and 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 weigh those evils and and put them into context, you know. Um, and yeah, I think there's just a huge lack of that right now of of being able to step back and say like, yeah, I don't agree with that, but you know, uh, Kevin Hart making a, a joke about you know, throwing a dollhouse at his son if he came out as gay is very different from someone like Kevin Spacey or, you know, any of these other abusers that that have been brought to light and stuff like that. But a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, um, people talk about them with the same amount of vitriol in their voice as they would for something far worse. Um, And I just, for me, it's about where are you putting your energy? You know, like... Am I going to get angry over a tweet or should I be angry about the, you know, systemic racism or the pharmaceuticals fueling the opioid crisis or, you know, all these other much bigger, much more important issues. Um, Global warming is the biggest, is a big one for me that I've always been very, very passionate about, you know, and, um, you know, are giving somebody shit because they don't drive an electric car or because they leave the lights on you know, is nothing compared to what some of these large companies do or what some film company, you know, bring it back to film, like what a lot of film companies leave behind in their wake of shooting something. Like there's so many bigger issues that that we could be focusing on. And it's just about having that nuance and being able to to take a step back and and kind of remove your personal feelings from a situation, which is really hard to do, you know? Yeah, well, and I think it also comes back to like... Like with Kevin Hart, I mean, he posted that joke years ago, like when Twitter first came about almost. And I'm like, given that time period, like just look at the movies that were being made then. There's no way we can make those movies now. (laughs) 
<laughs> like yeah, that much no. has changed with how I, our etiquette has become, how politically correct we've become as a society, you know? Yeah, if I'm right, I think that was like the same year that Shallow Hal got put out, you know, and like did well, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So like that tweet or Shallow Hal, one of them is way worse than the other one in terms of the message that it's sending. You know? Yeah, yeah. And like, it's all, it's all about like, I mean, there's somebody who will find like old 80s movies and get pissed off about every single one. And I'm like, it's the 80s. Like, it's yeah. like the time period. Like, you can't be, I mean, if you don't like the film, that's that's fine. Like, nobody's saying you can't like the film, but to be overly pissed off at it, like you're you're choosing to get pissed off at it at that point, you know, like, I I, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's the same with like people who say that like, you know, after Kevin, after the Kevin Spacey thing, using his as an example, they were like, (laughs) I threw out all of my movies with Kevin Spacey. And I was like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I hate the dude, too. But like you, you're going to tell me that. Yes, seven. (laughs) And you're going to throw that out because he's in the last five minutes or the usual suspects, you know, or like all these other classic films. And I think that that's a big thing right now um especially with entertainment of just like you know there was that whole issue with like tina fey and 30 rock with that blackface episode and and a bunch of other things like that that have been going on recently um and like don't get me wrong like those those are those are wrong like they should not have made those choices for sure absolutely Um, but I think it was on uh, Gaggle of Geeks that you guys actually talked about this. I, I don't remember exactly. Or it may have been your podcast, your last one with, with Patrick. But I'm pretty sure it was me. I was listening to you guys talk about this thing. And it's this idea of like, no, like, do what like Disney did with their films where you just put a, you know, a, a warning a thing on it, in yeah. front of it, you know, because it's about educating. And I think, you know, going, I, I know we're kind of bouncing between film and politics and social issues and stuff. It all like, goes hand in hand though. <laughs> for me, I think what my, something I've been very passionate about for a long time before I wanted to do film, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I, I think that most of the social um, and political issues in the world right now can be traced back to a lack of education. Not saying people are stupid, just like a failure in education, whether it's in the school system or in public discourse or in the media or whatever else it is. It's just a a lack of education and information um, about these issues. You know, a lot of, most people are not racist, but a lot of people do some pretty racist shit just because of a because of ignorance because they have never been taught better you know and especially right now with the black lives matter movement you know um i was watching uh, uh like a short doc uh, i think a vice doc or something like that um that talked about how like uh there was the story of like black kids who grew up in tulsa and had no idea about um like the tulsa um massacre and and all these other things in black history and on on the other side of it with you know a lot of people who are very you know um patriotic and and love the flag and they love the country and stuff but then they have these really kind of weird uninformed views of how american history has gone you know and um again it's that nuance thing it's like well you you're telling if you tell me that there is something bad about the thing i love you're saying that i am equally bad for loving that thing or or that I shouldn't love that thing. Um, and that's not the way to convince people of anything. And kind of tying this back into filmmaking, because I'm trying as much as I can so that people will st- stay tuned in and not suddenly turn into a political show. Um, <laughs> but tying it into filmmaking, it, it's from a producer's perspective, it's the same thing. When you're dealing with conflict on a set or when you're, um, as a as a writing consultant, I, I work. I help a lot of people with their scripts, and right. that's a skill that I really had to develop. Is how do I be critical of something without attacking the person behind that thing? You know, be critical of the idea, but not of the person. Like if they're out doing, if they're acting on those things, if they're, you know, inciting riots or whatever else, like yeah, condemn them too. But like if it's just an opinion. Or, or an idea or something they heard somewhere, a lot of people just leap to to be critical of it and, and to attack that person. Um, 
but they're they're just going to shut down and it's the same with giving feedback on a film script or or in an edit you know is you have to find ways as a director or as a producer to communicate your ideas in a way that is not critical or attacking or anything like that and even when you're dealing with heavy conflict where like I've had to kick people off of sets before you know and being able like finding a way to to basically say you're fired without like turning it into a huge screaming argument because then it just sets the tone for the rest of the crew who's still there and like you know you've you've got to be able to communicate in in a in an amicable way while still standing your ground and and getting your point across and sometimes i've i've been told that i can kind of like kind of hound on a point a little bit too much where i'll just say the same thing in like 50 different ways but eventually <laughs> i say it in a way that it does connect with the person and they may not agree with like my solution to the idea but they understand the problem and then they're more willing to work with you on a solution you know you have to come together about what the problem is before you can determine a solution for it and i think a lot of um a lot of acting coaches, a lot of script consultants, you know, a lot of writers that they are directors, they have that issue of they present their idea for the solution without ever stopping to establish what the issue is, you know, and so they feel like the other person is like, oh, you just want me to do what you want instead of helping them to understand why what you want might be a better option. Right. And I, I okay, it's kind of weird to tie it back into philosophy of all things uh because mm -hmm. in that class they you know they they teach you pathos logos and ethos that was my favorite class in high school by the way it was philosophy it was one of the only my senior year i skipped a lot of school and like that was one of the only classes i went to <laughs> was philosophy well, and you, you have to have all three components to make a compelling yeah. argument or to sound at least compelling at the very least you know depending on like what evidence you're giving or whatever but even in that class when you were disassembling arguments or why you disagreed or how their arguments could be improved, you would still hit all those marks and like it wasn't criticizing the person who wrote the book that you're supposed to write on or, you know, their, their viewpoints. It was criticizing their viewpoint and like how it could have been better or better. Yeah. Just yeah. in that sense. And I think, I mean, I'll tie this back around in a full circle. So like, and going back to social media real quick, I think a lot of people don't even know what that is. They 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 yeah. have a lot of fallacies and straw man arguments. You're just like you would fail, and like that, that's where kind of, I, that is where I get frustrated it's because you know I do have like the academic background where papers were a thing. We had to list sources, like we had to do so mm -hmm. much research, and like if we even attempted to like list any of the sources that these misinformed people list, like we would have been docked without a hesitation you know and so like that's kind of the frustration there but like you said you have to take the step back and realize that they don't have that and they yeah. don't see it that way but going back to screenwriting like you said <laughs> you apply the whole the, the same things you know like you're like where's the logic at where's the emotion and like how is it making people feel Boom. yeah ab absolutely and I, I i do think philosophy of all things taught me that and also being in a screenwriting class i mean kind of teaches you how to do constructively give feedback without shitting on the person <laughs> yeah and it's, it's hard it's a hard thing to learn and, and it's sometimes a different it's form not of, your fault yeah and it, it like, is a different form of feedback too you know and yeah and sometimes like i've had people get very defensive and yeah it's just yeah <laughs> we'll just say yeah, and it's not always you like the way you are presenting it you can present your argument perfectly and still have the other person just get defensive. You know, you have to understand that it's two different personalities. And, yep. and that's like one of the very first things you need to understand as a producer or as a writing consultant is before you even touch the script, you need to understand the person behind it so that yep. you not only know how to communicate, but know where they're coming from. Like you said, what were your intentions with this? What, you know, okay, this worked, but this didn't, you know, and being able to communicate with them, um, at the at, with core ideas instead of big overarching concepts right. or, or little minute details you know what is the core idea of this and um with even 
personal writing, you know, away from consulting, but just with writing in general, that's something that a lot of people struggle with in themselves is, is trying to figure out um, and applying not just with the entire script, but with each individual scene and each individual line, like, okay, what is my goal here? Does this line serve to further that goal or to move the characters forward or to provide an obstacle in that journey? Like, um, and it's something that I see so often where you'll just, it's, it's how you get exposition dumps. It's how you get over bloated films, like what Nomads was originally, you know, of just like, this does not serve the story. It doesn't serve the characters. And if you can talk to somebody in those terms, it's far easier for them to come to an understanding and be willing to make changes to their script, you right. know, or to what they're doing on set. Um, not just with writing, but you know, if, if somebody's like misbehaving on set or something or doing something that that is distracting, like you have to do the same thing of, of helping them to understand why what they're doing isn't working um, before you just attack what they're doing and making it a personal issue. No, exactly. I agree. And I, I mean, I like being a, like what's going like screenwriting, right? Being that kind of a writer is a different kind of writing anyway. And so if you give your script to somebody who doesn't understand how screenplays work to give feedback, it's going to be a whole different feedback than somebody who knows screen scripts and oh, also yeah. knows you. And because the feedback's going to be completely different. Like, I mean, if you read somebody's uh, prose, like, you know, if, if they give you a short story to give feedback on, it would be very much different feedback than somebody who's actually like an English major who understood <laughs> <laughs> that kind of writing because they're, just the, the two forms of writing are so different, but. And you need both. You, you do need yeah, both. And you that's really need both. And that I've actually, so I've, I've, whenever I get in this, these ruts, you know, like these, these writing ruts, I try to like lay off of not only social media, but like also like screen writing in general. Mm -hmm. And I'll switch like poetry or like um, novels because I feel like novels can actually help you with like vocab. Uh, <laughs> and how to describe things because they, they, they can expand on the exposition all they want and not get in trouble, right? And yeah. it, it, it's it's really weird going from screenplays to novels because like a scene that might be seem extremely like an expos like an ex expositional dump in a novel, it, it doesn't make you cringe as if you're reading it in a screenplay. Like it's it's interesting how the two they're then they're like the, the medium is the same, like writing's the same, but it's a different apply application to it you know like it's for the audience yeah. again it all goes back to that audience is who is your audience you know we i'm trying to i think it was it's either a lovecraft book or um f scott Fitzgerald. i, I read something a couple of years ago where like in the middle of the book they take like 70 page departures where they just cut to a completely different person who you've never met before, tell their entire history and backstory for like 70 pages, and then just cut back to the original story <laughs> yeah, where nowhere. they're now involved, you know? And in the book, it works perfectly. Like you, it, you don't stop for a second to think about it and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. But if you did that in a film, like, <laughs> No, like that's not going to work well for you. You know, you, you have to really understand your audience. And that's why, like you said, it's, I think readers, you know, or, or you, you have to be a reader if you want to be a writer and not just in your medium, but even there, a lot of people kind of fail. You know, I've met so many people who are filmmakers or who are writers who don't, right or don't watch movies or don't you know and it's just like you need to study you need to learn your craft in order to get better and you are not going to learn your craft from yourself you know you you need to look at other people and it's also an inspiration thing like you're you know everyone you're like yeah you want to write based on your own life but to be honest like most of our lives are pretty boring you yes, know they are. Like, <laughs> so you really need to and that's why like you know i don't I, I recently I've been watching more movies thanks to quarantine and I've been doing a lot of like movie nights with Emily and Jacob and other friends and stuff. Uh, we'll like get on Instagram video chat or something and then three, two, one play, you know, and get it all synced up. Um, but that's why I, I've been 
doing a lot more like usually we'll watch more documentaries or watch more like television and um especially like kids stuff because the kids shows are like they have to be so good at communicating information in a very simple and efficient way because they're short episodes they don't have a lot of money and their audience has an even shorter attention span than most of us millennials do you know so like watching those even if they're not all great and the dialogue is terrible or whatever like you will learn how yeah. to be more efficient with your storytelling you know um yeah, it's it's just it boggles my mind every time I meet somebody who, you know, it's not like you have to watch a ton of movies, but the people who like literally don't watch movies or don't read screenplays, you know, or anything like that. And it just uh, it, it's it's my biggest like red flag of like, this is going to be a long journey. <laughs> well, and I thought so I thought it was great. So I mean, let's tie in the festival now. This is a good segue, oh. actually, because. Um, on the panel I was on, uh, I was with was it three other women. Um, yeah, yeah, three other women, and I, th I thought it was a really great discussion because uh, somebody on there has didn't really know the craft that well, like they're still new to it, you know. And so just hearing mm -hmm. everybody who's dabbled in it at least, and then there's one that like actually intimidated me because of how much experience she had. And uh, when she was, Sky, when she was yeah, 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 when she was agreeing with me on experience. some of the stuff, I'm like, oh. Oh, like I'm not yeah. making a fool of myself, you know? And like, and at first too, like it was jarring being on there. Cause like, I didn't realize they're all women. Like I didn't look who was on the panel. <laughs> and so I like, to see them all on there and I was like the only guy and I was like, Oh, okay. Like I, I have to, I, I gotta get used to this. Like this is, it was intimidating, not in a bad way. It was just like, this is a whole different perspective than like I would have ex expected, you know? Yeah. And, um, being on there and like listening to them talk and like how they do stuff. Like I think the one thing all writers have in common and you could probably relate to this is just the need to tell a story in some form or fashion, you know? No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, it's definitely that, that drive is something that not everybody has and it's yeah. it, not all writers, even not all filmmakers have it. I, I know a lot of people who make, films and they're they're fine films or good film you know whatever they're 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 not bad filmmakers you know um but their motivations for it are very different from the what from what i feel my motivations are you know yeah. and i'm not even saying that my motivations are necessarily healthier because i i joke that you know i like depression fuels me <laughs> like i hate it and it's not the best but like it really is a great drive for for creativity sometimes because you just it's this burning need and this this feeling like if i do anything else or if i stop doing this for a second i am a failure or a terrible person or, or whatever you know that is and yeah it's not the healthiest viewpoint and you need to train yourself to to shift that perspective so that you can take that same drive but look at it in a more healthy way um, but it is that, that fuel that just certain people have. And I, I feel like I have it. I, I know you, you certainly have it. And I've met a lot of others who do, but it's, I'd say it's more uncommon than, than common of just those people who you look at them and like, that's all they can do. And not, not in an ability way, but like, that is the only thing that they personally can do because if they weren't doing that, they would just die inside, you know? Yeah, one well, like just thinking about doing like a like because like I do a nine to five job now, you know, like mm -hmm. to pay the bills. But like if I, whenever I think that I'm like is this a possibility of me being stuck here for the rest of my life? Not like for the job I work for necessarily because I think it's a really great job, but like just the the type of job, you know, the type of work, and it depresses me, and like it makes me think about how my parents did that, and I'm like, how how are you guys not going crazy? Like I would be tearing my eyes out, like. <laughs> Yeah. And some people are very happy in those jobs. You know, I, I, I worked, uh, I waited tables for 10 years and worked in retail and all that other stuff. And yeah. like, I met people who were almost as passionate about waiting tables as I was about filmmaking, you know, and, and it's just about finding your, your, your drive, you know, and, and finding peace in, in your path. Um, 
and even once you find that path, finding peace in in the acceptance that it's going to take a while, and and that um, you know, I especially when it comes to day jobs, like I've struggled with that, and there have been times where like I have not made the right choices um, because I was like, no, I'm a filmmaker, and I don't want to do anything else other than <laughs> other than film, you know. Um, and so I took jobs that I deeply regretted um, that were in the film industry because I was like, well, doing this is better than having a day job and waiting tables, you know. But it was like for scam talent agencies where I felt way worse than I ever did waiting tables because I, I knew, even though I maybe, you know, didn't acknowledge it at first that like, oh, yeah, these people are just taking advantage of these actors and not providing anything in return. And that will make you feel way worse, you know, being on a toxic set or trying to be trying to direct a feature film that you don't have any stake in and don't have any passion for the story. Like you're going to spend a year to five years of your life slaving away at this thing that's going to take up your every waking moment with no passion. Like that's that sounds like hell to me, you know, and that so does sound like hell. Yeah, going back to the earlier question of of like you have a quick turnaround rate, like that's part of it for me is like I wish I was making more. And if I wanted to, like I could get on and I could produce like I could probably produce like 20 to 30 short films a year of other people's that like that I just didn't care about, you know, that I was like sure, whatever, like I'll I'll, I'll do a little bit here just to have my name in the credits to, you know, to list myself as a producer. But like that it just feels so much more disingenuous and and lacking that passion just it makes it cost so much more in terms of your own personal stress and energy and self-esteem at the end of the day because i mean imagine having to do q and a panels for a film that you like not only didn't like but actually hated the experience of working on and you have to sit there and try and play nice and and say good things about people who either treated you terribly or you didn't get along with like no like that that sounds miserable you know so always 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 that that going back to earlier that question of like why are you doing this what is the purpose of this what is your motivation what are you trying to get across and find that passion whether it's a popcorn flick that you just want to watch a bunch of dudes drive fast cars and beat each other up you know and and have uh some very uh semi-erotic stare downs with each other uh, you know, <laughs> like, which is probably my favorite part of fast and the furious where i'm like they are about to fight or the other <laughs> <end."> <laughs> but yeah it's it's you have to have that passion and as soon as you don't that's why we hear all these stories about celebrities getting in beefs on sets or having blowouts with the director or whatever else you know or like christian bale i'm sure is not as big of an asshole as everybody thinks he is i mean maybe he is i don't know but like i doubt he's as big of an asshole as some people have labeled him for but you know hearing the st some other like stories around that particularly famous recording um, <laughs> it like i get it you know i get how you can be at the end of a long day and just lose your shit because somebody's in your eye line or like whatever the reason being you know but um you have to you know surround yourself with other people and and other motivations that are going to carry you through these massive projects that we we take as filmmakers you know and sure maybe you can move your career along faster or you can get paid a bit more money but like at the end of the day for me i i would much rather make no money off of my films and have no one ever see them but care about them and be passionate about them and be proud of them at the end of the day than getting a million dollars to make some fluff piece or, or some popcorn flick that like I have no connection to. See, and, like, I feel like, I don't know. Like, I feel like if I, for whatever reason got offered if you, to direct like a huge franchise, you know, that had like a buco bucks, mm -hmm. a part of me feels like I would decline it because like there, there's a chance I wouldn't be that invested into it. You know, if it's a, if it's a, uh, franchise that like, i have known nothing about mm -hmm. or even that'd be scared like anybody who takes on a star wars project going like here on forth has balls because that that the toxicity of the Oof. fan base around that like yeah. you are setting yourself up for either like total love or total hate there's no in between <laughs> yeah so at the end of the day you have to do it for yourself 
you know, and Ryan right. Johnson, like whether or not you like The Last Jedi, which I know we both really love, yes. um, <laughs> uh, but whether or not you like it or not, like he told his Star Wars story, you know, um, I, you know, I, I didn't hate Solo as much as a lot of other people did. Um, I didn't hate it. As I thought much. it was I, fine. Like it wasn't great, but it like it was fine. It was it was a fun popcorn flick Star Wars heist movie, you know. Well, and that one actually, like, I mean, if you want to get nerdy about that one, um, it kind of showed how much love he probably possibly had for Leia, you know. Like, if he yeah. went across the universe for this old flame, uh, who turned out to be, uh, betraying, in the very end, you know, like. Yeah how much would he actually go through for Leia? And I'm like, oh, that's such a cute thing to think about because like, you know, she's like, I love you. And he's like, I know. Like one of the be- like most badass ways to like, not even like, like imagine right. that Michael, like if some girl's like, I love you. And you say, I know, like what's her reaction going to be either like that you're an egotistical fuck or it, yeah, it definitely wouldn't come across <laughs> as well as, as Harrison Ford saying yeah. it. That's for sure. Right. It's like, I know. And then they're, ugh. I, don't know. I, I I like Star Wars movies. I just think anybody who takes that on going forth is yeah. playing a fire. <laughs> that being said, I would absolutely do it under the condition that it would be like a spinoff or a, you know, um, I actually wrote uh, and started producing before I pulled out because of a bunch of other reasons, but I actually wrote a um, a fan film and well i got asked to help write a fan film okay um and my conditions for it going in was that it had to be a completely original story um and that it would have as little to do with the larger star wars universe as possible so that we could tell our own story you know and and that it wouldn't be relying on like nostalgia or any of that other stuff um now i would you know be fine even connecting it to the larger Star Wars universe, but it would just need, you need to, like we talked about earlier, you need to have that personal connection. You know, you need to have that thing. And I think that, you know, it's one of the reasons that we have films like Logan, you know, where it's like, yeah, I would direct a big blockbuster movie, but I need to find my spark in it. I need to find what interests me. And you can still make concessions. The studio is still going to have a ton of input, but as long as you still have that one core idea or motivation that is, that connects it to you, you know, and that's, that's kind of what I was saying with, with solo is that it, with the Lord and Miller stuff, you know, like I would love to see that film just because it sounds absolutely crazy. But from hearing the cast talk about it, it does not sound like it was fun. It did not sound like it was going to be a good movie. It was going to be the director's vision maybe, but at the same time, like, I don't know if I'm just making an assumption here, but my guess is that as much as Lord and Miller are nerdy and love Star Wars, they maybe didn't find that personal connection in the story to Solo that they should have. And so, like, that's why you get this big difference between something like Into the Spider-Verse and what it seems like Solo was turning out to be while they were at the helm of, like, something deeply personal that they really connect to the story and that style of improvisation and really wild out there ideas can really work and thrive but then you take that into solo and like maybe they didn't have the connection to it or like they didn't have that they they weren't answering those questions of like why are we doing this like yeah we can improvise a little bit but like why are we improvising here what the the direction we're going with that improvisation does that make sense for the characters does, and that was that sounded like one of the biggest complaints from people on the set was that like it didn't like really go with what the story was or what the characters were, you know, and it just was just kind of wild and chaotic. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, I got a big point being, I would definitely do a star <laughs> Wars again, but it would need to be like a Mandalorian episode or which I think is the genius of the Mandalorian is you can have episodes that are kind of meh, but they're still fine because like you've got another episode in a week, you know? So who cares? Like, I think my, and they're yeah, still good. My only complaint for the Mandalorian was like, I think it f- kind of fell off in the middle. But like you said, like even though it's men, like we still got more. Mm-hmm. And then it picked back up. Like I think by the oh, end, yeah. time it ended, I was like, what? Like that's it? That's all we're getting this season? Like what the fuck? Are you so, kidding me? 
I want more. My, I know that I am so excited for the next one. My my only complaint with the Mandalorian, because I really, in fact, when I, I was hearing a lot of criticism of it from other filmmakers, um, because we're always more critical, uh, but I was hearing some criticisms of it, and I'm like, you guys, like this is literally a serial comic. Like it's just one offs. Like of course you're going to be annoyed that it it dipped because they're like the main story doesn't pick up as much. And yeah, I think that, that they could have sprinkled in the main story a little bit more, you know. But I loved that like old school kind of feel to it of just a very serialized story. My one complaint that really bothered me was actually the most nitpicky bullshit, but it was like for for the fact that Baby Yoda was oh, no. like this super, <laughs> super prized like payday for the Mandalorian, right? He did not do jack shit to protect that baby. <laughs> no, he did not. Just in, in traveling around. Like I remember watching, I think it's the second, is it episode two after he like rescues the kid or did he rescue the kid in episode one or episode two? I don't recall. I don't remember. Um, anyway, but it's after he uh has the he he teams up with the the robot and fights their way and they save the baby and then he kills the robot um and then they leave and the next episode starts with him walking through that canyon and they get ambushed right even once he knows they're about to be ambushed like the that that baby carriage has this like stainless <laughs> steel, like massive steel cover on it and he does not like with one push of his wrist he could have put that cover down and like Half of the issue, like baby's way safer, you know, and that was like it, that that happened throughout the series where like he's like, yeah, I'm just going to leave this like incredibly expense, like big payday, you know, bounty just roaming around my ship. Nevertheless, that it's a child, but like the, it's just like you're not going to protect your bounty like you're just going to let it sit out. And maybe I heard somebody say like, well, it's because he's so confident that he can take on anything. And I'm like, you know, like I, if I he's the smart at all. <laughs> exactly like if the smart bounty hunter, the very first thing you're going to do is like, well, let's lock this shit down so nobody can sneak up behind me and just like jack him while I'm not looking <laughs> like. No, seriously. Anyway, really nitpicky, but like that was my one thing that just consistently bothered me throughout the series where every time I saw Baby Yoda just being left to his own devices, I'm like, the fuck are you doing? Like you are the smartest bounty hunter around and like you're just letting him wander off your ship. <laughs> or like the, the I think it was the last episode with the two stormtroopers, right? How they punched oh, yeah. him. <laughs> Which I loved that moment between the two of them, like sitting up on the on the sand dune. Um, so, yeah. Well, so Patrick, um, I think it was like 10 episodes ago, maybe. It's been a while. It's whenever the news for the Stormtrooper movie was announced, right? And the, mm -hmm. what's his name? Taika, how do you say his name? Taika, Taika Waititi, Taika. who is my favorite director of all time. Yeah, and so he's at the helm of that, and he directed that episode. And then it kind of clicked, like, is the Stormtrooper movie going to have that same kind of, like, humor? Because, like, that's the most interaction that we've seen with Stormtroopers. That's not, like, yeah. you know, like, the new the new franchise with, like, Finn and... uh yeah what's what's her face the ray no the chrome chrome dome lady. oh with uh captain phasma Fan phasma yeah. yeah i was about yeah. to say phantasma <laughs> not quite right um, no 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 phasma yeah and like i mean you know there was like some humor there with those colon troopers but like that episode was shined a whole new light onto like oh they're just people like they literally are mm -hmm. just people like like you and I just on the job, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? And like seeing that sense, like that kind of piqued my my curiosity for stormtroopers, especially if the stormtroopers have nothing to do with Jedi. Like it'd actually be really nice for once, kind of like how the Mandalorian did, if we focus on something that does not have to do with the Jedi. Like we, we could be in the background for sure. Like let I all, would all love, be in the background. Yeah, I would love to do that. Is it like if I directed a Star Wars? Like I would love to do something like that, where it's like no Jedi. It's just because you have to think. Like I think they 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 very lightly try and touch on some of these things. And I think the the last if if they had continued on with what the last Jedi was kind of setting up, we would have seen a lot more of this. But the mm. fact that like if you're not living like in the outer planets where you are dealing with rebels and the stormtroopers who are more totalitarian, you, your view of the empire was going to be very different. You know, like a lot, I think, I don't remember which of the books it was, but one of the recent star Wars books that got put out kind of touched on this a little bit of this idea of like you, you know, it, 
for most people, like the empire is just like, uh, I'm trying to think, um, it was like the Roman empire, you know, where like you probably like you barely ever saw them. Occasionally they'd show up and like collect taxes or something like that. But for the most part, like you still lived your life once they took over. It was like, okay, we just pay our taxes to a new person now, you know? And I would love to see more of that universe explored. You know, one of the biggest complaints of Star Wars right now is that like there's this massive galaxy far, far away and we keep following the same goddamn family all around this, <laughs> this galaxy and we don't see any of the other people, you know? Um, but yeah, I think the Mandalorian has kind of shown that there is a hunger for that and I'm, I'm really excited to see some of the other series that are being developed and I would really love to see more, like you said, of like stormtroopers who like, I, I would love like Star Trek Lower Decks I would love like an animated series, comedy series like that, but it was like stormtroopers who were just stuck on some like far planet who never saw any action, you know, and like most of the series is their day-to-day -day, like <laughs> misadventures, but then like, you know, just before the season finale, like, oh, okay, now a Jedi shows up and like we can get the action a little bit more heightened or something, but then there's still comedy because it's like them being like, the fuck is that? Like, I don't want to deal with this. Like, I just wanted to sit in my outpost and like play cards. Just sees the Jedi like cut somebody right in half and they're like, yeah, I'm done. Nope, I'm like, done. I didn't <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm done. Which would be most, I assume would be most stormtroopers reactions, you know, once, once that happened. Right, dude. Like, if I saw a Jedi fly, like, not even flying at me, just running at me with like a lightsaber. Yeah, Yoda f doing a bunch of backflips, and you can't even like follow him. Like, no, I'm done. Yeah, dude. I'm like, I'm like, here's my gun. Place on the ground. Like, take my helmet off. I'm done. Like, I will join your guys' yeah. cause. <laughs> well, we saw a little bit of that with. Um, uh, I think it was it was either the Last Jedi or Rise of Skywalker where like Kylo Ren is I think it was Last Jedi where Kylo Ren is just like smashing the sh or no is it I don't one of them I don't know when Kylo Ren's smashing the shit out of a room and the two stormtroopers come around the corner and they're just like nope and then they turn around and walk away oh that was, I think that's Force, Force Awakens, Awakens. that's yeah. Force Awakens yeah oh man yeah <laughs> they, they turn the uh, corner and they like see those sparks fly out of the room and they're like nope. <laughs> they turn yeah, like I'm just completely around. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I would love to see more stuff like that. I think there's so much room for comedy and to be blunt, like good storytelling. Because as much as I love Star Wars, like it's very, even at the best of times, is very paint by numbers, hero's journey kind of right. storytelling. And it, it, especially with the idea of like gray Jedi and that, again, nuance, you know, <laughs> going back. Um, having more nuance in those discussions instead of just good versus evil. And like, that's why I loved the last Jedi so much was it set up like, Hey, this isn't just about the Skywalkers. It's not just Sith and, and, and Jedi. Um, and I was really hoping with the rise of Skywalker that that's how they would kind of end things was with Kylo and Ray saying, no, I'm not Jedi. I'm not Sith. We're just going to be people and like do our thing, you know? And they kind of hinted at that. And then at the end, they have Ray go, I'm a Jedi. And it's like, okay, well, that just kind of threw that out the window. You know, <laughs> so much for both of the, because that set up with like, you know, the, as much as I don't like the Canto Bite scene in um, The Last Jedi. Uh, I, I love that scene. I know I, I can go in detail about it, but. Yeah, on. I just thought it was, it was kind of lacking. Like I, I get why it was there as a story element and it, and I really liked what it was trying to set up, but I, I also felt that like, I don't know. Anyway, it was just, it just didn't quite connect for me. Um, but yeah, like what they were setting up there of like, no, these people that this bigger world, you know, of these guys who sell arms to both sides of the war. And like, there's just, there's so much more depth in star Wars and in star Trek and in all of these franchises that we have right now, that just don't get explored because studios are hesitant. I get it. They're spending millions of dollars on these productions, so they don't want to take too big of risks. But like being timid is, is far more off putting than somebody who takes a risk. And especially right now, like you said, with Star Wars being so divided in its fandom, like pick a side, you know, like just let a director make a decision. And that's something that, again, 
trying to link it all back into filmmaking because I, I feel like we've just spent most of the podcast nerding out and not actually talking about filmmaking, but that's fine with me. Um, hopefully the audience doesn't mind. Um, but linking that back into producing, that's that's another thing that's hard to learn as a producer is like when to give up, yeah. I guess, if that makes sense. Like in an argument, like there have been plenty of times where I have known full well that like a decision was going to make production more difficult like if it's going to ruin production i won't back down you know but if it's at the end of the day if the director really wants it and like okay like well th this is your story to tell and i'm gonna back down here because this is your story and you will find out you know, one way or the other, whether the audience is going to be receptive to that. And I may be wrong and I am always willing to be like, yeah, I was totally wrong on that, you know, and I've been proven wrong before, but most of the time, like, I, I feel like I'm, I'm usually, you know, proven correct that, you know, there's these things that, you know, you, you know that you're in the right on, but you just have to learn to say like, okay, you know what? We're going to let you go with it because you're the director and I came into this project because I want to help you tell your story. And if I get mad because you don't agree with me, I am not helping you tell your story. And we would not have films, you know, like Hereditary and like uh, just at pretty much most of A24. Like I love A24 because even their B movies, like... Fucking that are awesome. just generic yeah like even like not even fucking awesome the movies that are like kind of meh you know at the one thing they all have in common is they had a director's vision in them like you may not like the story they may not be plotted very well or they may get boring in points or whatever the critique is but every single one of those films has a director's vision that you can feel and see whether or not you like it it is there and the fact that they take those risks pays off because yeah you may have four flops or four movies that like barely make their money back but then you will get those two or three you know like hereditary or like with Blumhouse and get out and paranormal activity where it's like no we're going to take this risk and believe because yeah maybe not everybody is going to want it you know it may not hit all four quadrants but the people who see it are going to love your vision and they're going to be passionate about that. And they're going to support the film with far more passion than if we were just trying to appeal to everybody. And I think that's where Star Wars has kind of gone wrong is, you know, you look at those original, the original trilogy um, and they, they really like, they do take some risks with the way they go and not all of them are, are great. You know, we can all be as much as we love the original trilogy. Like there's some stuff in there that's like, eh, okay, you know? Um, but the point is like you, you have to, like I said, the job of a producer is to get the film done while protecting the director's vision as much as possible. And you have to be able to do that, whether you are the director or the producer, you know, it's, it's harder to step back and be objective when you're the director. Um, and that's why I feel like I label myself as more of a producer, even though I mostly have produced my own stuff. When I produce for other people, I find I do a much better job because it's just so much easier to kind of step back and be objective and, and help guide things without having a forceful hand. Um, and when you're both the director and the producer, that's next to impossible to do sometimes. No, oh, for sure. Um, yeah, directing and producing all at once, it's a bitch. <laughs> it is really hard, and I especially would definitely rather avoid it. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're also the writer of it, too. Like, it's definitely your vision if that's the route you're going to go. Yeah. But like, also, no. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's trial and error in that sense. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely make sure that I, if I am, like, using Nomads as the example, I was very hesitant with Nomads because I also had to act in it because our actor dropped out. Um, and that's, a, it's a huge red flag for me. Like, whenever I see writer, director, producer, actor, everything, you know, and it's not always the case. Uh, Quiet Place is the perfect example, you know, but at the same time, like, yeah, um, um, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Jim from The Office. Um, John Krasinski. Yeah, John Krasinski. Um, like, he didn't write A Quiet Place, but he took a pass at it. You know, 
he directed, but he was working with a very accomplished cinematographer and a production team who could help kind of guide him. So even though he was acting and directing, and I believe he is listed as a producer or a co-producer or something on that as well, you know, he made sure that there are those checks and balances in place. Because if um, you just power forward with nobody to put you in check, like not all your, you could be a genius and not all your ideas are gonna be great. Stanley Kubrick, I think, is an excellent example of like some of his films. You can tell he had somebody there to kind of like, yeah, let's pull that back a little bit. Whereas he's got some other films that it's like nobody told him no, you know, <laughs> and he's not the only director to have gone through that. And I think maybe, you know, that's another possibility of what could have happened with Solo is like Disney was like, hey, you had all this success. Like, we're just going to turn you loose. And then six months later, they're like, oh, shit, like that was maybe not the best idea. We need to rein you in a little bit, you know. Um, so yeah, you just, you need to have somebody there to kind of put you on check sometimes. That's why I love working with Justice is even though he's a cinematographer, before he ever talks about lighting or anything like that, he makes sure that he understands it from a writer's and, or from a story perspective first, you know, and he does give a lot of notes. Like if, if anybody ever, you know, has the chance to work with him, I'd highly encourage it, but you better be open to, to some criticism and some notes story-wise because, and and 90% of the time I'd say go with what he says because he's got v amazing insights, you know, and, you know, whether it's Justice or whoever else, like just find your person, you know, find somebody who you trust their storytelling and their craft and be willing to open up and send your script out. Personally, I don't think that somebody should go into production on a short film until their script is at least in the seventh or eighth draft. Like most of mine hit 10. Uh, our last short film, Neighborhood, technically only had four, but there was also like draft four version five, you know, like there's lots of point, <laughs> point five and point sixes that, that go like It changes that paragraph change. around. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I do that where I label every single script that I have with like D five V six, you know, and I, I save as, and I keep all those different versions so that I can always revert back to them, you know, but that's, you, what, that's what I do now. Yeah. yeah. And it's really helpful, but I really think that like, you should not you shouldn't send it out for feedback until like maybe your second or third draft. You should not be going into production on a short film until you get into your seventh or eighth, maybe even ninth. Um, and on features, I, I don't think you should be going into production until you've done like 15 or 20 freaking drafts. Like you need so much work. And, um, you know, I, the biggest for all, whatever criticism I have of a film, oftentimes when I'm watching independent film, um, that whatever faults or criticisms I have in it can be traced back to like clear, like they needed more feedback in the script or if they had just spent a little more time on the script. You know, if you're not great at dialogue, find somebody who's good at dialogue and just say, hey, will you punch up my dialogue for me? And you don't have to take everything that they suggest, but like have them go through it. And you will learn that way and eventually get to the point where maybe you don't need to be sending it out for dialogue as much because you develop those skills. But at the end of the day, you have to surround yourself with people who aren't just wanting to do the same thing as you, but who are pushing you forward, either because they are better or because like you, they constantly want to be better. And I have worked with a lot of people who are very passionate about movies. They love movies. They like being on set, but they don't have anything. They don't have that motivation behind them to improve. Um, and, and there's nothing, nothing against them, nothing against their films. It's just like you need to be able to have that because that's how we learn and we grow and improve. Otherwise, you're going to make, you could make 50 short films and you're never going to get any better. Like maybe you improve on small things here and there, but overall, like you're, you're going to hit a ceiling. And in order to break through that ceiling, like I don't even know if breaking through the ceiling is the right way to say it. I would say you need somebody to reach down and grab you and pull you through that ceiling. Um, because you, once you hit it, you won't be able to figure it out yourself. There is a ceiling to all of our skills and that it's not an, uh, like a hard to find thing that you're never going to get any better, but you will hit a point where without a mentor or without people around you who are going to push you forward, you're never going to get any better. And as much as I love making movies with my friends, that's probably the biggest culprit of that 
is like, hey, we're just making movies with friends. And that's awesome. It's really fun. I love it too. But at the end of the day, like your friends probably aren't going to be those people, you know, and, and you need to find those people. And I am sure I have pissed off friends or made them feel slighted or unintentionally, you know, because I didn't work with them again. And, and it's nothing to do with them personally. It's just like, I didn't get that vibe. You know, I, I didn't feel that push or I didn't feel like they were on the same page and there's nothing wrong with that. It's nothing against them, but you have, if you want to go anywhere in this, in this industry, whether it's writing or as a director or producer, whatever it is, I'd say that is the biggest thing you have to have is that group of people who are going to keep pushing you forward. They don't always have to even work on your films. Uh, Nick Fry is probably one of the biggest mentors I have. He, he is one of the most knowledgeable people about filmmaking I've ever met. Um, I have never worked with him before. I've never had the opportunity, but I send him everything I do because I know he will like without holding back, rip it apart, critique it, tell me how I can improve, tell me what I did right, tell me what I did wrong. Um, and every phone call I have with him lasts like three or four hours. Um, but I learn so much from, from those phone calls. And yeah, I just find a mentor, like find somebody. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you. I'm like all of that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a, there's a point where you reach when you like, you know, if you, it's fine to make uh, films with friends and mm -hmm. especially um, because in, well, like, if you're working in, in the industry to some extent, like you're going to have the film friends, you know, mm -hmm. but in a way they're going to be like partners, like work partners, essentially kind of like if you yeah. talk to people in your office, you know, outside of work, like it's just that kind of dynamic. But um, I think there's one filmmaker who, filmmakers a group of filmmakers who might still work with their friends and i, I think that's more in like the subgenre of like mumblecore because they yeah. need all the help they can get yeah and with indie film you you are gonna need yeah. that help but at the same time you don't get you can't get complacent and yep. like it, it's again it's about setting that goal and that standard of what do you want from your career? If you just want to make movies with your friends, that's fine, but be honest about it, you know? Be honest with yourself and with your audience of like, hey, we're just a bunch of friends and we're out here making films. Don't, you know, call yourself a production company and try and, you know, get clientele or, or, or you know, post on social media saying how awesome you are, you know, whatever else it is. Like, if you let ego get involved, you know, it it will be your downfall every time. And, and that's the trickiest thing to handle. Is it's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's so hard to do, you know? And so I don't judge anybody on it, you know, and I try very hard to, to be clear when I am being critical of someone that like, Hey, it's nothing to do with them personally, but it's just, it, do you want this to be a hobby or do you want it to be a career? And if you want it to be a career, you have to be willing to, tell your friends no and that's like it's the whole reason why you have that too many cooks in the kitchen problem on a lot of indie sets where everybody wants to give their opinion and then it slows production down or things get confusing and it's just like you you cannot do that you know even if you're making movies with your friends on an indie level because you can't afford to pay anybody which is what we do you know we we have i have had one production that i've actually been able to pay my cast and crew on um but you have to be able to still set that standard of like, hey, we are friends, we're all here just to have some fun, which is awesome, but we're still gonna run things a certain way. We're still gonna be critical of each other. We're still gonna, you know, you, there was a great quote from a Film Courage video. I don't remember who the person they were interviewing was, but um, they basically said like, the, the question was, how do you find a good producer? or How do you find a good producing partner? Um, and they said like, you need to find somebody who you can get into a screaming argument with and still be able to work with the next day because you both understand each other. You're coming from the same place. You have the same goals and you know that this is not personal. This business is not personal. And that, that big production I talked about that fell apart, that was where I really learned that lesson is like, even if you are making movies with your friends, this is, it's, it's reason it's called show business is because this is a business. You need to try and, you don't always have to try and make your money back. I have i don't think I've had a film yet where the goal was to make money back, you know? Um, 
but you still need to be trying to have some goal of either building your audience or making money back or whatever that may be, you know, and um, in order to do that, you have to be able to set those standards, you know, and you have to be able to enforce those standards. Um, and I have been on a lot of indie and student productions where it was just a group of friends and they were not able to do that. And it really affected their production. And the filmmakers were n oftentimes never even aware that it affected production because they're like, yeah, it was awesome. We had fun. It was a good time. We had, it was the perfect set. We had no problems on set. I'm like, really? You had no, no problems. You didn't have a debate. You didn't have an argument. You didn't have, you had no problems. Like I, I cannot fathom that on a, on an actual film set, you know, because that's what is going to push you forward is having that debate with somebody, having someone there to put you kind of in check sometimes, or to, even if you still go with your gut, like to at least, um, kind of resist you a little yeah. bit and, and kind of have that, you know, question you like always have somebody who's going to question you. Yeah. No, I fully agree. I, I agree. I, I, that's all I can say about that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I feel like it's, it's, uh, it's been a, awesome conversation i feel like we've touched on like every every topic except like like any of the stuff we originally were going to talk about <laughs> um well let's talk about something that's more relevant then uh i, I did mention it, your festival you, yeah. you had a festival play over this last weekend mm -hmm. um talk about that like what inspired you to get that forward because we are in the middle of a pandemic and yet you yeah. somehow pulled an all online virtual screening for all these local filmmakers to show their films and have Q and A's and even panels. Yeah, it was, you know, we called it the one story, one community celebration, but Which, it was a film festival, you know, like as far as how we ran it for sure. Yeah. And when I, I love that name, uh, like when you, I don't remember if you told me that's what the name was going to be, or if I just um, came across it on your website, I don't remember exactly how I came across it. Mm -hmm. It's been a, it's been a long, Oh yeah. Long court team, but um <laughs> I just like the, 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 the vibe that they, that gives off like one story, one community, right. It's like, it's so inclusive of like a whole community and how they're trying to tell one story and the one story is not the same, but the one story is like, they're, they're still trying to tell one story, you know? And like, yeah. that's, that's the moral of the story is that like, they still told a story as like one whole community, you know, <laughs> like Absolutely. it's so fucking badass. And it's kind of a, that, that, that name, uh, maybe not super consciously, but as I've come to think about it more and more, it really comes from, I'm a big history buff. I, I really have always loved studying history. And the more you study history, the more you come to realize that um, history is made up of just a lot of different small stories that eventually build into a big, big one, you know, Um and that's really what we all do in our individual film communities is we all have these many, many different stories and these many different viewpoints and ideas and opinions and beliefs. Um, but, you know, we're, it, it's hard to step back and acknowledge that when there's something so massive happening, like a pandemic, you know, or I'm sure like, um, many people, because uh, when I study history, it's less necessarily about dates and stuff, but I just love reading stories from people who were in those times. Right. Um, and the, just the normal people, how did normal people affect, like, it's cool to read about the leaders and the people who made these big decisions, but I'm more interested in, in the smaller stories of the people who had to deal with the consequences of those decisions, you know, um, or how they, you know, were, mostly forgotten to history, but had some big effect that even they didn't realize at the time. Um, and I think that that's really what I wanted to do with this event was to provide an opportunity to see a lot of different films from a lot of different filmmakers with different opinions. And, you know, some of them had religious tones and other words were very edgy or experimental. And, you know, some of them were more kind of student or amateur leaning and others were very high production qualities with big budgets and yep. all this other stuff, you know? <laughs> 
Um, and uh, it, it's, it's actually kind of funny when we reached out to the Utah Film Center to collaborate with them, one of the first questions they asked was like, well, can you send us the screener so we can kind of see like the quality of the films and make sure that we feel comfortable attaching our name to this? And I said, well, yeah, of course, I'll send that over to you. Um, but and I was very tactful with my wording where I said, well, you know, um, we really wanted this to show the breadth and scope of Utah's talent and filmmakers. So some of them are a little more indie and, and amateur and others are more high end, but we want to show everything that Utah has to offer. And um, but yeah, anyway, so it's it's the idea that like we are all so tied up in what is going on right now because it's very overwhelming. We have these massive social movements. We have uh, a very conflicting and, and difficult um, election year right now um and on top of that this massive pandemic and murder hornets and all kinds of other shit you know it's just it's a lot for anybody to handle but if you think about it in context of history in a hundred years from now they're gonna write this in a textbook and it'll be maybe five or six pages and a lot of it'll be summarized or skipped over you know everything else um so i think it's just imp i i thought it was important for us in the moment to take that step back and and to see that bigger picture of Utah's film community and and what we have to offer um, and the different talent and the different ideas and opinions that are that are involved in that um, as that that that's more to the name as far as what actually inspired making it it was. Um, I, I've worked at Slam at the Slam Dance Film Festival for the last couple of years, um, and even before the lockdowns had hit, um, just as it was kind of being classified as a global pandemic, um, I had friends in a lot of other countries who were talking to me and telling me about how bad things were getting there. While uh, here in the states, it was still very much an attitude of like, ah, that's happening other places. It's not going to hit us here. It won't be that bad, or you know, oh, it'll Boy, probably we speak too soon. <laughs> I know, right? Um, but I, not to not to be all, I'm so smart, but I kind of saw the writing on the wall and was like, if this does, if it does hit, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but like. I think it's going to hit. And if it does hit, that's going to mean lockdowns and it's going to mean film festivals will be delayed. It's going to mean that film productions get shut down and all this other stuff. And so I kind of had already had some experience with live streaming and recording and um, putting on this kind of stuff through slam dance and a few other projects that I've had. Um, and so I kind of jumped on that and uh, reached out to Slamdance to ask like what their plans were um, if this did if the event did get canceled um, at the time they were like well we're not really sure we're still kind of waiting and, and seeing and stuff um, and I was uh, somewhat intoxicated uh, hanging out with Jacob and I oh, turned no. to Jacob and and I just said do you think uh, we could produce like a mini slam dance in two months uh, and Jacob just looks over me and goes, well, I'm sure you're going to fucking try. Because <laughs> <laughs> he knows me and he knows like anything I have that's like an idea, even though I say it hesitantly, I'll inevitably try and, and follow through on. Um, but yeah, it started as this like, well, let's see if we can just do what Slamdance does with their polytechnic workshops and their screenings and stuff and just shift it to an online platform. Um, and even if it doesn't, I, I figured like maybe we have like, it's a one day event, you know, originally we were planning for it being in like June or July. Um, it'll be just like a one day thing with a few of our filmmakers and like not many people will show up, but it'll be an example for other, for me to take to like other film festivals and, and show them and say like, Hey, look, like this is how we can do it. I'd love to help you. That kind of a thing. Um, and then it just kind of exploded bloated from there and just snowballed where um, I believe Justice was the first one to be like, well, why don't we just reach out to the film center and see what they would have to offer? You know, we didn't think they would like sponsor us or anything or collaborate with us, but um, we were like, let's just reach out and see if they would be willing to, to just put their name on it or, or connect us with some people and that kind of a thing. Um, and then it was the film center who kind of was like, well, if we're going to do this, like, and put our name on it, like, 
what did you have in mind? And I kind of figured like, well, let's oversell them and then we can kind of scale it back because they won't want to do all of that or be involved in all of that. Um, and it was not the case. And they, they really loved everything we said. And so all of a sudden I found myself uh, like, oh no, this is, they, they, you know, they originally it was going to be like a benefit or a fundraiser for the Utah Film Center. And they were like, well, we'd rather just have it be a collaboration and like, don't give the money to us. Like, just, let's just do this kind of a thing. Um, and they were a bit busy with what they had going on. So um, they weren't able to offer a ton of support, but they were able to put us in contact with certain people. Um, we had a change of plans, but originally we were going to be um, hosting the event at the Artist Foundry. And, you know, so they, uh, in the end, they didn't quite have as much involvement as we had originally hoped or as much as they originally hoped. You know, they really wanted to help us with this and really wanted to make this the best it could be. Um, and they did a ton and we're very, very grateful. But, you know, just things happen and with 2020 like things really happen um and so uh it, it kind of moved into more like sponsoring or kind of a like collaboration kind of thing but um that was still a huge help for us because it, it gave some legitimacy because instead of just being some unknown you know indie filmmakers who are like we're trying to do this thing like do you want to help us it became like no like this is a real thing we have some legitimacy this is worth getting attached to and being a part of um, and so we were able to get access to certain filmmakers uh you know a lot of there were several films that um weren't even fully done yet that the filmmakers were finishing up that they like kind of sped up and and hurried to finish up so that they could um premiere it or give like a sneak preview screening as part of the event you know so it it was a huge huge help um but yeah it really came down to just uh me kind of turning to uh to jacob and then eventually to emily and was like hey like i know we've only got a couple of months but like i want to produce a film festival and that's something i've always wanted to do but i figured i would do it when i was in like my 40s or something you know um but yeah uh we pulled it off and <laughs> like it's uh i was not i was constantly having anxiety thinking that there would be something going wrong or that you know and you know there again i'm very self-critical and so there were certainly mistakes that were made and things that i would like to do better but in terms of the actual event like it went great people had a really good time it really you know going back to what you're we talking about about what is the goal or what is the purpose of this you know um it really fulfilled that goal of of bringing people together of showing what utah has to offer of um of providing an opportunity to filmmaker for filmmakers to connect and interact in the middle of this quarantine and all this stuff and it's been um it, it's been a really hard road to get here and there were a lot of moments where i did not think that we would make it but seeing the responses from the filmmakers and then eventually from the audience as well was just overwhelming and made everything so worth it because um they you know it, it, it was a lot of just gratitude from them of just like thank you so much for just putting this thing on and providing this opportunity for us all to connect and get together because that is something we've all really been missing we're we're filmmakers even though a lot of us are introverted we're still very social and we want to work with people and we want to connect and we want to go to film screenings and watch movies together we've all most filmmakers wanted to become filmmakers because they sat down in a theater when they were little kids and were just overwhelmed by an experience and and desperately wanted to find out how to replicate that experience you know and um and i think that that has kind of with covid and with the lockdowns kind of I think maybe people have forgotten or longing for or one thing or another, but people have kind of lost that. Um, and I, I really wanted this to just be an opportunity to, to provide that for people. And, and I think we, I think, I think we did. I think you did a fantastic job at putting that together. Thank you. I, 
I uh, I was gonna say like there was a lot of gratitude because it was a long email thread of people saying thank you. <laughs> it was it was <laughs> a, a very a long, long email reply thread. all email thank yous. I'm like man, this is so I know, cool. That was, like, we, I hope we Michael probably should have yeah we probably should have like BCC'd instead of just <laughs> sent it off to everybody so not everyone was having to get infinite email <laughs> notifications. But yeah, it it has been a great outpouring of love and support not just for us but for each other. I think that a big thing for me that people who are watching the event didn't so much get to see was in the, cause we use zoom to set it up. So in the zoom waiting room, when filmmakers would come in and, and be prepping for their Q and a to start or for their panel to start hearing them talk to each other and um, be able to meet people who they'd maybe looked up to or had been watching for a while, but never had the opportunity to actually meet um, and there were a few people who I actually heard discussing collaborations and, and dis you know, and as a producer, like that is one of the best feelings for me is even if I don't ever get credit for it, knowing that I helped facilitate this new relationship or this new collaboration and that that's going to hopefully result in some piece of art or, or filmmaking that's going to impact people and um, bringing, you know, a I'm bad at this, but like allowing myself a moment to bring in ego of just like, that feels pretty damn good, you know, of, of like knowing that I helped possibly put these pieces on the board and, um, and that, you know, what we're doing is, is going to have long-term effects and I may never see them and I'm totally fine with that. Um, but just having that feeling of knowing that, I impacted people in some way and that what we did was meaningful. And, um, you know, I, I've gotten some other personal messages that were a bit more intimate talking about, you know, how much someone was struggling with depression or with um, anxiety with everything going on in the world and how this event helped them kind of come out of that or gave them some relief from it for a little while. Um, and I think that is easily the most rewarding thing about this whole event. I mean, I, I certainly hope that it will do a good deal for my career and it does look really good on a resume to say that you produced a film festival, you know, but um, at the end of the day, like I, I just, I just want other people to, to enjoy filmmaking as much as I do and to, to connect with people as much as I want to connect with people. And um, so, yeah, sorry, very long winded, but, but yeah, I, I, that was what really, sparked this event was just the isolation that everyone's been feeling um, and wanting to provide some kind of relief for that in whatever way that we could. And uh, it was months of work for two days, but I, I hope that the effects of that will um, be more long lasting and that will, it will give some kind of relief for, for people right now. See, now I was kind of thinking that because uh, you were never very intrusive on the zoom calls at all. Like you would wait for them to get in. You're like, okay, I'm going to cue you guys in. Like when the credits start, you know, like I'll mm -hmm. talk to you guys. And then like, you just like opt out. Like you turn your video off and your mic off. Yeah. And like, I was listening to them. Cause like, you know, I was on zoom call for like a day um, mm -hmm. and just listen to them talk. And I'm like, dude, if Michael's listening in right now, like he'd be fucking smiling. <laughs> like I was like, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm glad that like, you're able to like do that, dude. That's, not a lot of people could say they, they've done that. No, it's, and, and I will, you know, it does feel good and it's definitely an accomplishment. Um, I don't think it's fully sunk in yet as far as like the magnitude of what we pulled off. I think that was the biggest shock was I thought like, I mean, it was a ton of work. It was four months of, right. um, I had to, I, I quit my job basically. I moved I in the middle of this for some other reasons. I, had to move back in with my mom. And then at that point I was working downtown and having to commute downtown plus work on this festival and everything was just a bit too much. And so I got a part-time job out here, quit my other job, um, drastically like tightened up my budget and my belt a little bit, um, and just put all my energy into, into this event. Um, but, even with all of that, like as much of hard work as it was, I could not have done this without, uh, I mean, Jacob, but also particularly Emily Gardner, who was our program coordinator. Like she handled 
so much of the communication, drafting the emails. You know, I was able to just focus on creating the assets of organizing the actual schedule and curating the films and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, while Emily handled the far more tedious and far more stressful day-to-day, -day, you know, communication things. And, um, you know, it was, I, I guess, sorry, I guess what I'm saying is that even though it does feel very good for me personally, and yes, it, it feels great to have people acknowledging the amount of work that I put into it, um, I guess the thing I want to just make clear is that it would not have been possible obviously without the filmmakers themselves, without all the Q and a moderators, without you helping as host, without Emily, without Jacob, you know, there were so many more people who um, had a hand in this and, and maybe it, it wasn't as much of a hand. Maybe it wasn't as heavily influenced by them, but it does not detract at all from what they put into it because it, I would not have been able to do it without them. And, and they are an incredible group of people, the people at the Utah Film Center who, you know, every time that they, you know, weren't able to, to help us in a certain way that we'd asked or whatever else, like it wasn't, um, it was, it was always with so much sympathy and like, Oh, we would love to, we're so sorry. We can't do this. Or, you know, like, well, we can't do that, but here's what we can do. And like, they were so eager to help us all the filmmakers, you know, when we had, people drop out were, you know, of like moderating Q&A, they were very quick to jump in and say, yeah, hey, I would love to help out and moderate that panel since you lost the other moderator or, you know, um, or, or in this case, like with, uh, you know, this is, again, we're not perfect here. Uh, I totally dropped the ball and for one filmmaker and for uh, one of our hosts uh, neglected to send out contact emails like I should have. And then they just never heard back from us for like two months until like two days before the festival. And then it was too late for them to, to jump in and help out. And I felt terrible. But even those people, you know, who I totally screwed up, I dropped the ball. Um, and I'm sure it was very inconvenient for them to suddenly change their schedule so suddenly or to have this thrown at them at the last minute. Um, even they were incredibly kind and understanding at what we were what we were doing and were so supportive of it. You know, I have to give a huge, huge shout out to to your co-host for Gaggle of Geeks, Patrick, because, you know, he wasn't able to step in for that reason. And and like even then he was still like, I want to support it. I want to help you. I think this is amazing, you know, and so um Honestly, almost that was almost more of a thing carrying me through than than anything was because like every time I made a a mistake or I forgot something, um, I would just beat the shit out of myself for it because I was like I can't afford to make mistakes right now. Um, but then to have everybody else be very kind and understanding and and still be supportive of it even after those mistakes, like. Um, just meant so much and made it so that I could keep going and then I could refocus and say, all right, mistakes were made, but let's, let's refocus, reevaluate what we're doing. We can move forward kind of thing. And sorry, I feel like I went on a little bit of a tangent and a ramble there, but yeah, I'm just very, I'm still processing everything and I'm just very overwhelmed by how much support we got, how much love and, and, um, just, yeah, it, we, we just have such an amazing community here in Utah and, I'm glad that we were able to give something back to them, but even in giving something back to them, they were still giving us things, you know? So it's just like, um, yeah, just very overwhelming and very humbling to, to have, to have gotten through this. So, you, you know, with how successful this last festival was, your next one's going to have higher expectations. <laughs> yeah. And we are already talking about it and thinking about it. Um, we probably we're we're hoping to, at least for right now, um, we probably won't do another screening event until uh, sometime next year. Um, hopefully, hopefully early COVID. next year. Hopefully COVID yeah, sucks. Exactly. And um, and that's kind of why we're like, if we do something this big, it is literally the same amount of work, um, whether it's online or in person. Um, and so we, if we're going to put that amount of work in, I would love for it to be in person this time. That being said, unlike a lot of film festivals who are saying they will not come back until it can be in person, if, and unfortunately it's rather likely, we are still <laughs> dealing with this into 2021, um, 
we will do another one of these uh, hopefully early in the year. But until then, um, we're actually going to be taking the discussion panels that we did and expanding on them. So we're taking the six discussion panels that we did for this event. We're going to be posting them onto YouTube and onto podcasting platforms. Um, and then we're going to be trying to arrange similar Zoom roundtables um, for filmmakers to discuss uh, the, their craft and what they've got coming up and things like that. Um, I would love to do a few film screenings. I know it's kind of, I mean, we had 23 films and we were kind of not scraping the bottom of the barrel, but like it was becoming harder and harder to, to find other films that were made recently. There are lots of films made in Utah, you know, but one's more recently uh, is, is definitely getting harder and harder thanks to, to COVID. Um, so I think waiting to do a, another screening event until next year to kind of give some filmmakers time to finish up films that were in post right now, or that, you know, now that productions are kind of starting up again, hopefully finish some for of those. now <laughs> for now. And I'm, you know, I'm starting one of those. For we've now. Got, uh, <laughs> yeah. We have two film shoots coming up. We've got one. I, I did not give myself any time to recuperate. Um, uh, not because I'm awesome, but because I forgot. I honestly thought I had two weeks between the end of the festival and our next film shoot, and I was completely wrong. Um, but yeah, we have two film shoots coming up, um, and so we're hoping to put out two short films by the end of the year, um, one of them being Neighborhood that I wrote and direct, and then the other being uh, a script called The Redman Ripper, um, which is a, a slasher film um, directed by Emma Charlie who's an awesome writer and director. And she brought me in to, uh, at first she brought me in to act. Um, and I, I kind of said like, well, if I'm going to act, I, I, I kind of want some input on the script. Um, and she was amazing about that. and was like, Oh, absolutely. And so we did a pass of the script together and then, um, I didn't ask for it, but because of just how much I had been involved and just giving advice as well, while we were talking about how to do production, she would mention like, oh, well, I think we're going to do this. And I was like, oh, well, here's a, here's like a way to get around that. Or here's a way to cheat that. Um, just my producer brain kicking in. And so eventually she was like, well, do you want to just produce it too? And I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, so I, I'm really bad at saying no to things and uh, just it stacked one thing right on top of another. So um, I think, but I, th I think it's going to be fun. I think she actually reached out to me about, I think the same project. I, I, yeah, I suggested that, <laughs> that she did. Um, yeah, she, yeah. I, I didn't get back to her. I should probably get back to her, but, um, I'm like, Ooh, slasher dude. I'm, I'm all for slashers. I've never, it's I don't act though. So that, that's a whole new thing for me is that I don't, I'm not an actor at all. <laughs> oh, that's okay. And not to dampen your spirits but like i think there's not a ton of acting in the scene that she's having you in so don't be stressed i think it's more what what caused it actually was that i had mentioned uh you in regards to the event and she was like oh i know Chaz. like i didn't know you knew him too and i was like yeah um and then i said well you should reach out to him to come on and just do a little like bts photography you know uh because he's a really good photographer um and she was like yeah and I bet I can have him be like the park ranger that gets murdered or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like he should act in it too. And I was like, hell yeah. Like, so really it was kind of an excuse just to get you to come on set and hang out with us while we're, while we're shooting. <laughs> yeah. I need to get back to her. I need to go through my messages. I've been so shitty this whole quarantine of getting back to people. And like, you can probably even ask Emily. I never emailed her back about anything. And then like, if I did, it was like two weeks late. It's not just you, poor Emily. We, that was probably one of the most stressful things about getting this event going. It wasn't the technical side of it. It wasn't how big it was. It was just trying to get people to respond to the goddamn emails. Like, <laughs> and, and like people who I knew, I'm like, normally you're good at getting back to us. So what the hell? Like, yeah. But yeah, it was, it's, it's just, it's everybody right now. Everyone is so overwhelmed with zoom calls and emails and all that other stuff. Cause it's our only way to communicate for the most part. Um, and so I think a lot of people are just getting kind of tired of it. <laughs> yeah, no, I felt bad for not responding back to her. And then I guess, uh, Emily Clark mm -hmm. sent an email too with questions and like biography stuff. And I totally <laughs> overlooked that one too. So we're about to like do Q and A. She's like, you never sent me your stuff. And I'm like, huh? Like, what are you talking about? And it's because yeah, I totally overlooked the email. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sure you weren't the only one. I know. Yeah, it's that that's just kind of kind of comes with the territory. I think that was probably the biggest like unexpected learning lesson was I figured that the technical side of things and like the logistics of curating would be the hardest part. Um but really it was like it was the communication and just getting everybody on the same page and um some of that was because of people being difficult to get a hold of and some of it was just because this is the first time we've done anything remotely like this and especially this big um and so it was a it was a hard learning curve especially at first of like learning how to structure things how not just structure the festival but like our workflow you know how do we approach organizing this and what are the priorities at the start versus what should we wait to focus on until later um and there were definitely like lots of mistakes made but nothing that was too big nothing that we couldn't rework and figure out and move past and um yeah it was just such a huge success um as far as like the i don't know, like not boasting but just like it was a huge success in terms of like nothing went wrong we didn't have any major issues and um everybody seemed to be very happy with it um and we had about i mean even in terms of like the regular success like we had roughly 300 people per day tune in um usually we had like t between 25 and 40 or so people watching at a time um and that was across the two days so technically for the whole festival um you luckily youtube shows you like the unique viewers versus the people who are tuning in and out um, so just with unique viewers, we had roughly 570 people um, who attended the festival. So uh, Holy at shit. least, yeah, at least for like a block, you know, or um, or a panel. Um, Fuck yeah, dude. Yeah, comparing that to we we looked at like other not not as a like comparison to like see how well we did, but. In, in researching how to do the festival, we were looking at a lot of other local festivals and how they structure their stuff um, and like what their rough, rough turnout is. And um, honestly, we are about on par or exceeded um, a, lot of the, a lot of the physical festivals that, have, that we've been to um, and even on par with some of the online ones as well you know that have a bit more of an established audience behind them so um yeah like it was it was definitely a very successful thing and i i don't mean that so much in terms of myself but in more of just like you know that goal of wanting to bring the community together and um we thought like oh we'll, may we'll maybe have like 100 people or so across the two days um and to have like nope yeah, no, it was it was way bigger than that, and um, thank God my computer was, was survived it because uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I was watching the, the the software we use like shows you a graph of of how much CPU usage and graphics usage you're you're going through, um, and like your stream encoding and stuff. And there were a few times where those numbers like spiked right up and I was just like, oh God, please, come on, baby, come on, <laughs> stay with me, don't die on me, we can do this. Um, but yeah, no, it was, yeah, it, it was very successful in terms of like what we were trying to accomplish and um, people really seem to enjoy it. So we'll definitely be doing more of this um, as soon as possible. I'm excited to see what else you have in store. That's fun. Thank yeah, you for letting me be a part of that too. Like, I really appreciate that. Of course. Yeah. We like, I love uh, gaggle of geeks, which is why I reached out to you and Patrick to, to host. Cause I know I love watching that show and you guys are both really engaging and really insightful. And uh, uh, I wanted that, that same kind of uh, charisma to kind of help be kind of a, a transition between the block. So it wasn't just one thing after another, you know, um, and yeah, you, you were, you were great. It was really great to have you. So thank you. No, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, let's start wrapping this up. Uh, yeah, we've been we... going for two and a half hours now. <laughs> and in, knowing me, like for Gorilla Film Guide, the, the podcast that I, we've been dead for a little bit, but the, that I used to run um, was about the same thing where it would be like two and a half hours or three. And then I would like edit it down to an hour and 15 or something like that. And, oh yeah, oh, no, this, this, is gonna, this is going to be the full length. Like, <laughs> Oh, awesome. Well, I hope ev- everybody <laughs> listening enjoyed all of our random tangents and stuff. I promise keep... Uh, I, I, hopefully you kept going and enjoyed the end because that was where all the real filmmaking stuff came in. <laughs> but yeah. No, I, th- oh, I think that's a really good note to end on too, especially if I end it on this question. Ready for this? Okay. What's one piece of advice that has stuck to you throughout the years and how do you apply it to yourself? Oh, man. Um, after after all we've talked about and after everything that you, you're talking about that you've learned and how it's all a learning curve. Yeah. Um, I think there's lots of pieces of advice that have really stuck with me. Most everything we've talked about has been like something that I learned from other people and took me forever to apply it to myself. Um, so instead I'll say the thing that I think I'm still and probably will always be working hard to apply to myself. And that's to, um, just to be forgiving of yourself and to keep going forward and to know that if you love filmmaking, if you are passionate about storytelling, um, whether it is comic books or movies or, or through music or whatever it is, um, if there is something that you have that inner drive and that desire, like we talked about earlier, um, do not give up. No matter how much you fail, no matter how many times you want to give up, no matter how many times it fucking breaks you, like just keep going. Even if you were, you know, you have to work that day job or whatever else, like just keep going because I can tell you like, for anybody, I mean, I feel weird saying this, but uh, if anybody is like looking at what we've talked about and and um, doesn't know me and so assumes that all the things I'm talking about are actually like way bigger than they actually are, you know, um, I there have been so many times in my life that I have wanted to quit, that I have felt like I was done, that I made some mistake and it would ruin my career. You know, that big project I talked about that fell apart. Like I thought for sure no one would ever want to work with me again. No one, you know, it would ruin me. Um, but it's not true. And it doesn't matter. I guess the other part of that is like, don't look at YouTube views. Like they do not mean a damn thing at all. Um, your audience, you, you will find them eventually, you know, and, and they will be the most passionate people and they will love your work and you will be embarrassed and humbled by how much they just gush over your films when you think they're terrible, you know, like, it, but you will find that audience, you will find your success. You just have to, you know, sometimes you might have to shift your perspective of what success is or how you define that. Um, but if you have that passion, keep going because you will find it eventually. It may not be what you expected. It may not be what you initially wanted. Um, but eventually you will find a way to fulfill that drive and that desire for creativity. And when you do, it will be the most just, um, euphoric feeling in the world. Um, and I can honestly say as much as I love all the films I've done in the past, it wasn't until we wrapped, um, on this event that I kind of had that feeling really for the first time. I mean, I've been elated every time I left a set completed or every time I released a film, um, it has been a euphoric feeling and I've been very happy, but in terms of like an overall for my career or for, for us as a, as a company, um, it, it wasn't until we wrapped on that, on that event that I really was just kind of, uh, it wasn't even like a, an excited hyper, like, oh, fuck yeah, you know, it was, it was just a, like a calm, a, a very contented, calm feeling that washed over me that was like, no, I am, it, for all my imposter syndrome, like, I am good at this, and maybe this event doesn't springboard my career, but I know that eventually I will hit it, you know, it wasn't that I have hit it, but it was just that very calming knowledge that eventually I'm going to get there and I have the drive to do it and I have the skill set 
Um, and anything that I don't know or don't have the skill set for, I know I can learn. Or as a producer, I know that I can find people who do have that skill set. And it's just about patience. It's about communication. Um, and it's about being forgiving of yourself and, and being patient with yourself because it's, you know, it's been five years, six years for me, and that has felt like an eternity. But in terms of a career, that is nothing. You know, that is a blink of an eye in terms of a film career. You know, at least when you are aspiring to be on the level of of the major filmmakers that we look up to, you know, like I know you and I both really love uh, Denis Villeneuve and, and, you know, like that's... Dude, I, I will know, cry. Like I will my, cry when that trailer is released. I know. <laughs> I'm so excited. I am so damn excited. But yeah, so like that's who I aspire to be. Not in the size of films. I don't necessarily want to do blockbusters, but in terms of like what kind of filmmaker do I want to be? When you hear Denis Villeneuve talk about film craft, like you Dude, have he, never heard anybody who loves it more. He's you know? so passionate about it. I fucking love it. And he's yeah. so humble about everything too. Exactly. And so that's what I want. That's that. When I say have somebody you look up to, find a mentor. It doesn't even have to be someone you know. Just find someone like that who not in the, how big their movies are, not in how much budget they have, but in how passionate they are, how much they love their craft, how much they are continuing to learn, find those people and look up to them because that is what's going to make your work better by not comparing yourself and feeling bad about it, but comparing yourself and saying like, hey, I'm not there yet, but that's where I want to be and I know I can get there. Yeah, he's actually on my vision board. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> he's, he's on the set of Blade Runner and it's like a him it's like the scene scene with like the water on the ceiling you know with like jared leto mm-hmm. and like harrison ford like oh all meeting. yeah but he's sitting on the chairs and like, you just see the camera in frame he's just like looking at the paper like all deep in thought i'm just like fuck yeah dude right yeah no that's it's a uh, he's not he's not on my vision board but a lot of stills <laughs> from his films are on my vision board and um, yeah, I, I have a playlist of YouTube videos and interviews and stuff that I go through and watch anytime I'm feeling imposter syndrome or writer's block or anything like that. And there are a lot of them that are Denis Villeneuve and Roger Deakins, especially, um, cause that's another guy who is just so humble about his craft, but is, you know, I, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I won't go on too much longer and fanboy out, but like there, there is an interview that I heard or read with Roger Deakins where somebody, um, basically said like as a master of your craft what advice would you give you know this that and the other and he said well i kind of i don't remember his exact words but it was like it was like well i kind of take offense to you saying i'm a master or that's not entirely accurate you know because honestly i just kind of step on a film set and and say oh that looks nice or or, that doesn't look nice and let's try this here and and honestly like I have no idea what I'm doing every time I step into a new project. Like we just kind of figure it out and decide what looks good and how best to tell the story. And, you know, that kind of humility and that particularly that view of film craft of like, there isn't a right way to do it, but there is a best way to do it. And it's just about striving to find that best way of telling your story, you know, and it's not going to connect with everybody. It's not going to always work, but like, it's out there. And as long as you set that goal for yourself, eventually you're going to find your voice and you're going to find that skill set that will allow you to create work. That's on the level of the people that you look up to and those, those masters that as we, as we call them, you know? Yeah, that's fun. And dude, I'm, I'm actually excited because now, like, I mean, like Denny's probably like our Tarantino, you know, like we'll always have Tarantino, but like, he's going to be like one of those filmmakers that, millennials can actually look up to but then the question is like what who who of us is going to become like that next you know like what films like it's gonna be interesting looking at films like when we're like you know in our 40s or 50s if we make it that far thanks covid um (laughs) (laughs) uh, to see who who's around our same age who's making that big of marks you know like in the film industry so i'm excited for that yeah and and like it it may be somebody that we're familiar with now and it may be somebody that we've never heard of that comes out of nowhere you know but and it may be you and it might be me like we don't we have no idea like that's that's the point is you are never going to know where you will be at until you get there and so you just have to you can't set your standard based on the past based on you know oh i want to do what tarantino did or i want you know i guarantee you that 
Denis Villeneuve never went through and was like, I want to be just like Kubrick or I want to be just like, you know, Coppola or whoever else. You know, I'm sure he looked up to those people, but you and maybe for the start of your career, you know, you do kind of have to copy a little bit and and, and be like, I want to try and do that shot or that, you know, one thing or another. Um, but but eventually you do find your voice and you'll have no idea when success hits you, but one day it'll just come up and slap you in the face and, and shake your hand and, you know, and it'll be just like that. It'll be a slap in the face and, surprise, and pleasant at the same time. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it'll be a very pleasant surprise, but, you know, it's it, it'll be just, and I don't even know if you ever do really realize it. You listen to Denis Villeneuve and he does not sound like somebody who's like, yeah, I'm successful. You know, I don't think he would ever utter those words, you know? Um, Cause I that think would, in order to reach that success, you, you have to have that humility. Yeah. Well, he's, he's very critical too of his own stuff. Like I know with the yeah. Dune coming out, I was reading this interview and he's like, you know, we had all this time in the world and then this thing hit and now we are rushed to do reshoots. <laughs> he's like, I don't yeah. know if it's going to be work off. And I'm like, you're doubting yourself what like right well did you read that interview you did about post doing post on it and how yeah that's... how it's hard to do it like virtually <laughs> yeah in quarantine and how he was and how he i think i don't remember exactly what he said in it but it was something along the lines of like i don't know if we'll even pull it like i don't even know if we'll even finish it and i'm just like yeah you you will but like you know <laughs> And that's the thing. I'm sure so when like, it's not, you know, I'm sure it won't be a masterpiece. Everyone will have their things that they can nitpick about it and stuff. But like, it's still, you know, from him, like, it's still going to be something amazing. Like you don't, you don't make a movie like Arrival or Sicario, you know, or I don't know if you've ever seen any of his short films, but like oh, yeah. even his short films are brilliant. Like I don't, you know, they don't all connect with me, but they're, brilliantly done and he has a vision and he he has an attention to detail that you don't see in a lot of filmmakers and like at the very least we know that like whatever the lowest bar is for Denis Villeneuve it's going to be like way higher than anybody else's <laughs> bar so it's still going to be an awesome experience you know <laughs> yeah I'm going to cry I, I will cry I will officially cry if they push that movie back yeah because um, I, so I know Tenet's going to be released in Europe before it hits US and that really upset me. Like, I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? Just yeah. don't do that to us. Like, don't torture us like that. Right. And then there no, no words is out on Dune yet. Like it's still set to release in December. Yeah. Part of me doesn't want to get hopeful, but there's also part of me. It's like, what if that's the one movie that we get to see in theaters this year? You know, like, yeah, fuck. It, it would definitely be a, a good Break. I'll cry. Good, I'll, yeah, I'll, I would I'll be, be happy. regardless. <laughs> See, that was for, that was me for Blade Runner twenty forty nine because I grew up on the original Blade Runner. My dad was a huge Blade Runner fan, and it was one of the first rated R movies I ever watched. It was that and <laughs> Alien, um, yeah, but uh, and and Predator uh, <laughs> at like age five or six. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, like that was me for Blade Runner. Every time I think they twice, they pushed back the release date and I was like, I swear to God, I'm going to die. Like I need to see this movie. Uh, and I wasn't as big of a Dune fan. I love the original Dune just for its campiness and just how crazy it is at times. But that's like just an eighties, you know, seventies and eighties thing. That's a lynch um, thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's just like oh, okay. Like I also didn't read. I've never read the books. So, um, so the I'm, I'm curious. I'm I'm glad. So they're splitting it up in two parts, which I think is good. Yeah. Um, the book's not that long. Like I mean, it's relatively not that long, but it is so detailed that makes me happy when they announce that. Like I was like, they're go they're gonna do it right. Like they're gonna fucking do it right. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing I know, like, just based on the original movie, you know, and I, I read a thing about how the, the, I forget his name, but the director of the original Dune. Lynch, David Lynch. Okay, no, it wasn't the director. Uh, maybe it was a screenwriter. It was somebody who worked on the original Dune movie. Um, basically said, like, it's impossible to do a good Dune movie. And so you just have to hope for, like, the best like take on it i guess ba or the best adaptation specifically like it's it's a book that's almost impossible to adapt because of just how complex it is and and all of that i have I do, if anybody could do it though i think villeneuve can like at least get close like the most close oh, yeah. to it you know i was gonna say like 
I, I again I haven't read the books, but like uh, Arrival was a pretty layered, complex <laughs> storytelling, you know. So even if like, he can pull that off, I'm sure he will uh, again. You know, even if the low bar is here, like <laughs> for for Denis, that means it's way up here. So I I am super excited. Yeah, and I mean, it, also Enemy is like very complex and it's not oh, easy yeah. to understand. It's like he's great at mind fuckery and like thrilling mind fuckery, like. <laughs> And he doesn't like make like he doesn't make it easy for the audience. Like he purposely like he's like the information's there. It's for you to decide, right? Like which I love. And I mean, I know we're running way oh, over. But it's fine. It's we're fine. Just, if, we're if they out. are still listening at this point, like they're here <laughs> for this, so it's okay. But uh, and I I read an article that he wants to do lower budget stuff after Dune. Thank he, God. Oh, yeah, yeah, and I'm like that means more fucking enemy, dude. Right, by More all means, trippy. give him the money to do a short film, not a short film, like a lower budget yeah. tier, you know, like let him, like, if because I know Enemy was even going back to like a rival budget, like, even though that was still a big budget, like, yeah. that's lower, that's like half the cost of his, of Dune and Blade Runner, you know, yeah. So, like, let or, him go or, back to that. Um, in Sunday, in Sunday, yeah, like, that's a great film, mm-hmm. too, you know, especially, yeah. I mean, if he does French films, like, I'm all for it. Oh, yeah, I just love Denny and like. I don't know. I got my tattoo because of him, you know? Yeah, I saw that. It's awesome. It? It's way go. good. <laughs> that, that one last, I'll, I'll tell one, one last quick, quick okay. story about the first, when I saw uh, arrival on opening night, um, did you cry? I cried in the first I five did. minutes. Oh yeah, absolutely cried. Um, and then I cried again at the ending when it all connected and realized like a full what it was circle. about. Yeah. Um, and when we left the theater, you know, most people kind of got the, um, the the gist of of what it was but they still hadn't quite it hadn't quite sunk in and they didn't fully you know realize it um but like leaving the theater i remember like my mind was just blown and like a like a kid talking about dinosaurs like i was just non-stop over like going through every beat in the movie that connected and how all the all the web of of that film and story um and it was it was really fun to like see people's expression as I was talking with the group of friends I was with as they like of, of like, Oh yeah, I'd forgotten about that part. And now it does make sense. And like, as soon as the, it clicked for them, like they had the same feeling I did of like, Holy shit. <laughs> like, this is amazing. Well, and like the, the movie, like uh, the movie's not, I mean, it tries to be subtle with like when it's supposed to click. Right. Oh, it's very subtle. And just like even that moment in the theater, like when it clicked, being like, did they just do what I think they did? Like, yeah. What? And there's like, there's, there's obviously the very end, which is like the, if you haven't gotten it yet, like here's the, here big, it is. You know, here <laughs> it is. And even that is done pretty subtly. Um, but then there are like, I think I, I'd say there are probably like two other points earlier in the film where, where if you've really been paying attention, you can work it out. Um, and, I went back and rewatched it in theaters just so honestly, like I, I, I less watched the film and I was more watching the audience and seeing like, all right, when do people get it? And you could see <laughs> other people like through at different points in the third act where it clicked and all of a sudden they would turn to the person next to them and be like, did you get that? And they'd be like, no, what are you talking about? He's like, don't, don't you understand what this means? And <laughs> yeah. they become, they become Charlie day from a, uh... Yeah, it's always sunny it, Philadelphia. Right? Exactly. Yeah, but like they like mid movie, they would like they would stop in the middle of the movie and turn to whoever they were watching it with and be like, "Did you get that?" And then they would be so disappointed when the person hadn't picked up on the on the cue or whatever, and like, and they'd be like, "Oh, oh my God, you you don't understand yet." I'm sure they'll explain. Yeah, it was uh, just as like, and that's what I miss about the the theater experience most. I think not to go on another tangent here, but like that's what I really miss most is it's the there is something so different of watching as a director of watching your film, but of watching any film in the theater with a huge group of people, especially horror and sci-fi and stuff, that you whole, know, the where, whole, a vibe of it. Yeah. It's just the vibe and then getting to go back a second time. And instead you don't have to pay as much attention to the film. You can pay more attention to like the audience and like really see Like I remember quiet place was the same way where like I went back and watched it. I watched it once. And then this at the end of that screening, I realized I was like, literally everybody in the theater who had bought popcorn candy or drinks they all stopped 
He still had a full box of popcorn or candy or a full drink. Like nobody would make a sound because they were so hooked through the entire thing. And it was so tense that like, literally, I, th- I remember the second screening I went to for a quiet place. At one point there was one person who was probably a little bit drunk and they weren't even talking, but they were just eating their popcorn and like just the sound of somebody eating popcorn, there were a couple ladies like two rows in front of him who would turn around and be like, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Stop eating the popcorn. Like, yeah, it was that, that tense for it. So yeah, I, I do miss that. And I hope, I, I, I hope that we will get back there soon. And I, at the, if, you know, I, I know we still have a while with this whole COVID thing, which is why we put on this huge event is because I was like, this ain't ending anytime soon. We will definitely have a few months to put this together. Um, But I I hope that theaters will start to come up with more alternatives of how to safely start bringing people back because we won't be able to have that full experience again, you know, but I've been like the drive-in theater coming back, I think is one of the coolest things. And one of the silver linings of, of COVID is like having that return. Like, I mean, thank God there are still a few of those left, you know, like we would be stuck doing VOD like right now for everything, Paying but at least we still have that. Almost 40 fucking bucks for my lawn. Oh my God. I, yep. Yeah. Not to go on another one, but wait, I, I listened to your guys' episode talking about that the other day, and I am right there with you where, like, I get it, but, like, it's on, like, again, pay, like, 20 bucks, or, like, I again, I get that it's all families, and so there's probably, like, five people watching it, and so, yeah, they lose revenue, but, like, either delay the film and wait until you can put it out in theaters like you want to, or don't screw or you know don't be money grubbing and i know it's disney but like yes maybe there is a family of five watching it but like you know maybe do the maybe do the humane thing and like hey you know what like we're only going to charge 20 bucks for this you know like for a rental which is higher but like right now everyone even like unless you're above you know the the upper middle class economic line everyone is struggling right now and that is a lot of money to drop and like you know it would have been can you imagine how good of a pr move it would have been like disney makes so much goddamn money and they're still making so much money even through quarantine like can you imagine how good of a pr move it would have been just to be like hey you know what we know everybody is kind of depressed and struggling right now so like Anybody who got Disney Plus, we're just going to drop Mulan for 24 hours, you know, or for for a weekend. And you can watch it, but then we're going to take it off or then we're going to put a fee on it, you know. Um, And there's so many, like, I I feel like companies are always looking for, like, PR moves. Yeah. But they also won't, like, the biggest PR move you can make is, like, it it has to be selfless in some way, even if it does kind of serve you still a little bit. You have to have some kind of, at least the appearance of selflessness and have some genuine motivation for like, hey, like we, we get that things are rough right now, but we're going to help you out. And I think that's why, you know, for all of their faults too, like companies like Tesla do really well, not just because Elon Musk is a super genius or whatever, but because they do at least give the appearance of like doing the right thing and caring about their, their customers. And and even if their customer base is like rich people, you know, they still put on that appearance of it. Um, And I think that's, you know, there are a lot of other examples of not just in the film industry, but just across the board um, of companies who like, you know what, like we make plenty of money and it's okay that we just like lose a little bit right here and not being, trying to since we're wrapping up trying to put this back into film it is the same thing with producing where yes you have to make money you need to pay your crew you need to pay off your investors and all that stuff but you can still do that in a genuine way you can still have you know you can do that in a way that's not being money grubbing and and doing that is going to grow your audience far more than anything else you could possibly do because people see that and they want to reciprocate for it. You know, like that's why we, we put on, like we put on the event for free was like, we, we said, yeah, we could easily charge like 
four or five bucks and that's not a lot of money um but if the purpose of this event is to get as many people to see it as possible and to bring the community together then that is a gate for certain people like there have been plenty of times in my life where i could not afford five dollars for anything that i wanted personally you know yeah. um and so i would much rather um, even if it, it eats out of my wallet, I would much rather have something that the audience that is going to appreciate and is going to brighten their day a little bit, because then you know what, like maybe we don't make as much money, but they subscribe to our YouTube channel and, or they follow us on Facebook. And then that's going to make it so that they see the next 10 projects that we do, you know, making this small sacrifice now is for the right reasons is going to give us long-term aid. And that's why I said earlier, like, don't focus on views. Like, yeah, you can make a video that's going to get 20,000 or, you know, at least on our level, that's a lot where we're like, oh, wow, my short film, you know. Um, but even if you got a million views or, or whatever it is, like, um, that's how long does that last really? Yeah. You know, and it's about that longevity and doing and always putting your audience first, whether it's through the storytelling or through your distribution or or through the the people you work with and and the and the the or the social issues that you stand up for, um, always put the audience first, and it will lead you to success. It won't always work, you know. Uh, Denis definitely put the audience first with Blade Runner, and it did not make its money back. You know, it, it struggled. Um, they still gave him Dune, though. <laughs> but they still gave him Dune. Like, they gave him one of the biggest movies ever, you know, or going to be one of the most expensive movies or whatever, you know. And afterwards, again, just like you said, he's going to go back to indie films, and then people are going to be like, hell yeah, we'll throw it. Like, we saw what you did with $100 million, so here's 50 to do whatever the hell you want with, yeah. you know. So, yeah, just just think about your audience, put them first and genuinely care about them. If you are just using them for views, they're going to figure it out. Yeah. Don't be, a Di don't be a Disney. Right. Don't be a Disney. That's, that's the message here. Put out movies like Disney cause they do make a lot of really good movies, but don't be like Disney as a company. <laughs> like um, all right, Michael, let's wrap this up. Uh, what are your plugs? Where can people find you? Yeah, so uh, Borland River Media um, on Facebook and Instagram is the easiest way to find us. We do have a Facebook page for our upcoming short film. It's just Neighborhood Short Film um, on both Instagram and Facebook, I believe. I think one of them is just Neighborhood Short and the other one's Neighborhood Short Film. But if you type it in, you'll you'll find it. Um, and yeah, B-O-R-L-A-N-D River Media. Um, on Facebook and Instagram. We post everything that we do there. We don't post a ton. I, I really wish I was better at social media sometimes, but um, every, you can find us there um, or you can follow me personally on Instagram at Cosme Curious. It's like Cosmic Curious, but with only one C in the middle. Um, and yeah, other than that, like just hopefully you'll all come back when we do another one of these events and check out neighborhood. I think it's um, like we've been talking about. It's a story that I think is really personal and that I think um, will have some impact on people because it is about loss and isolation. And, you know, we, we had no idea how um, pertinent and applicable those, those themes were going to be when we filmed it in February, but you know, two months or a month later, it became very clear that um, those themes were a lot more relatable. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it, it, I think it's also just a really good story. And frankly, Justice Page, like his, even if this, even if everything else about it is crap, like it's worth watching just for the visuals because Justice is an incredible cinematographer and it, it looks so good. I actually had somebody who, works in like the Hollywood industry um, paid the compliment that um, he, he asked what camera it was shot on. We told him it was the black magic pocket 4k. Uh, and he said, honestly, if you hadn't have told me that I would have thought you shot it on an airy, like with, with full cine primes, you know, like, um, God damn it. And justice. That, that, that <laughs> all is, that all is credited to justice. Cause yeah, he, he can take a potato and turn it into a camera and make it just the most beautiful goddamn thing you've ever seen. He can make a potato look delicious as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
it, it, he made some peaches look delicious as fuck in this film. Like the, mm. these are some really good looking peaches. <laughs> Moving to the country, <laughs> right? I love that song, and almost nobody's heard it. it it's, I think it's a it's a '90s thing for us '90s kids. But yeah, I love that song. Dude, the music. Well, okay, just one last tangent. That music video is like all ninjas, and it's fucking great. Anybody who has it's not amazing. seen it, it's Peaches by the Presidents of the United States. Yeah, it's one of the best music videos. It's so good. I love it. Fucking <laughs> fucking ninjas with peach trees. Yes, that yeah. that is correct. It is so worth it. But. It's on the same level of like the safety dance music video, <laughs> where it's like a bunch of like people at a Renaissance fair, but then. The, the the band is just like still rocking out like it's you know it's yeah it's just the most bizarre amazing thing and i love it i love it yeah um, um yeah right. thank you so much dude no thank you uh you can find me on twitter and instagram you find the face not the facebook the podcast page on facebook twitter and instagram and all that shit i'll be in the show notes Woo. um michael thank you for coming on dude i appreciate yeah, it thank you and check out gaggle of geeks it seriously is such a good podcast like you guys do such a great job and oh. i i look forward to it every week so thank you if yes. you haven't checked that out yet check that out get gaggle of geeks every friday um patrick Beatty's on that he's been on the show twice now so what a guy <laughs> okay what a gent sir michael i hope you have a good night you too man thank you it has been a, a really fun conversation and thank you for anybody who's still listening <laughs> so, three hours in but it was worth it it was a lot of fun thank you right now you hold the record for the longest episode so damn i feel, feel proud fuck yeah <laughs> okay bye